Hello, my name is Austin Gergen. I'm a graduating Oregon State University student, and this is my large video on designing PCBs. What PCB are we going to be designing? Well, it's the one that you see on the screen there, and it's also uh, this guy right here. Got a little blinky light on there, a little PW on blinky light, right next to the very bright 5 milliamp power LEDs. And uh, yeah, that's what we're going to be making. So this very long video is going to cover quite a few things. We're going to talk about PCB basics, so stack up and stuff like that, selecting components, we're going to be talking about schematics, layout, routing, silk screen, and then finally ordering the board from JLC PCB, and that includes actually having them assemble the board so you can get it with all the SMD components on it from the factory. The board that I designed in these videos does have one problem that I want to be upfront about, and that is that when you power it from USB, uh, even the 12 volt power LED comes on. So power is flowing backwards through the 12 volt to 5 volt regulator and it's turning on the 12 volt LED and I haven't added a diode or anything to fix that. So when you power the boards from 12 volts, it does what it's expected to do. But when you power it from even 3.3 volts, all of the power LEDs still come on. They're just slightly dimmer. For those of you that are familiar with Arduino, probably the biggest difference between this board and an Arduino is that the Arduino, you know, you can program through USB right there. Um, this board, we are going to be programming through the SWD connector, so the serial wire debug connector, and wow, that's not focusing at all, but it's a, it's this, this 10 pin connector right here. And the way that I actually interface with that connector is I have this uh, Chinese programmer, this STM, 32 programmer here that I got off of Amazon and I'll link in the description. And I've just broken out the SWD IO and SW clock lines to the uh, SWD connector. So I'll include that in the description below. While this entire video will be using KiCad for the design of the PCB, this is definitely not a KiCad tutorial. I don't go through how to do everything super efficiently in KiCad or how to you know do everything that you might need to do in KiCad. So this tutorial can kind of apply to any PCB software. I will cover the basics, but this is not a comprehensive KiCad tutorial by any means. Just to quickly go over the functionality of this board, we can take in six volts to 12 volts via this barrel jack connector. We regulate it down to five volts that also gets broken out on this board so you could use it to power other five volt stuff. That five volts gets stepped down to 3.3 volts via a LDO, and then that gets fed to the microcontroller the microcontroller can be programmed via serial wire debug. We can communicate with the microcontroller through USB. And then we have broken out every single pin from the microcontroller that we can actually use out to these header pins out here. So you can kind of think of it like an STM32 Arduino that can't use the Arduino IDE, so you have to use the STM32 cube IDE, which we'll dabble a little bit in in these videos. If you have any questions on these videos or if something isn't clear, please leave a comment or send me an email at my email address below. And uh, with that, let's jump right into PCB basics. So before we actually get into designing the PCB, we're going to go over just the basics of what a PCB is, what the different layers are, why they're there, how you can use them, and uh, yeah, all that good stuff. So I'm actually in KiCad right now. You can see the board that we've got here. In fact, you can pull up a, a 3D viewer. We'll be going over how to import 3D models for the different parts and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it looks, looks pretty cool. You can post it on Discord and brag to all your friends. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's why you're designing a PCB. It's to brag to your friends. All right, so let's, uh, let's just start with the copper layers. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to turn all these layers off. There might be a, a quicker way to turn all these off. I'm sure there's a quicker way. I don't know it. Um, we're just going to start with the copper layers. So in this case, we have a four layer board here, which means that we have four copper layers. So we have a top copper layer. We have our top inner copper layer, our bottom inner copper layer, and then uh, our bottom copper layer. And so if we look at the front copper layer here, this is where I have, uh, you can see, you know, the components are placed on this top layer. I've got signals on this top layer, I've got ground on the top layer, I've got some power on the top layer. Um, and generally what you'll do is your each of your copper layers is going to have some different type of functionality. So in this kind of instance, uh, with my stack up, the front layer and the back layer 
R4 uh, signals, and then I pour ground over the top of it. Um, and then the first inner layer is just completely for ground, and then the second inner layer is for power planes. And then overall those, I, I tend to just pour ground over wherever I didn't need it for other signals. Um, you know, some people don't like to pour ground on their boards. Um, honestly, for the stuff you're gonna be doing, you're probably not gonna notice a difference, but I recommend just pouring it on your boards because the way that they actually make PCBs is uh, they have to actually remove copper. They don't, it's not an additive process. People are trying to make additive, but it's not really a thing yet. Um, in like mass production. So they have to strip copper away. So the less copper you have on your board, the more angry your board house will be. And uh, you, wanna, you wanna keep them happy. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, well we've got all these copper layers on top of each other. Uh, how do we keep them from shorting out? So if we go over here uh, to our board setup, and I'm not expecting you to remember this right now, but what we can see is that we have our copper layers and then they're either separated by a thing called core or prepreg. Uh, core is a thicker, more rigid material. Um, prepreg isn't as rigid and as thick. It's like a, a weaving pattern type thing going on. There's so many different types of core and prepreg that you can choose. Um, FR4 is the most common core that you're gonna deal with in load speed designs. And if you're designing something for a class, it's probably considered a low speed design. Um, and then prepreg, usually each kind of board house, you know, at least with Chinese board houses, they all kind of have their different prepregs and then they kind of give it their own name. Um, but really what these do is they separate the layers and they do it in a controlled fashion. So if you want to get a desired impedance, you know what the dielectric is separating those two layers and you can set up your traces so that you can actually get the correct impedance. And then what we have here is we have this epsilon R and uh, that is our dielectric constant. So that is actually, you know, defining the dielectric constant of the layers between the copper so that you can get controlled impedances and stuff like that. Um, and then lost tangents for high speed stuff, we don't worry about it. But that's, that's kind of the, the meat and potatoes of the PCB or you have your copper and you have your dielectric. Um, and that's what's really, what's really making the, the stuff happen. So the next layer that I'd like to talk about is the solder mask. And this is a layer that's kind of put over the entire board and it helps kind of protect the traces and all the stuff from, you know, shorting out or from any unwanted contact. Um, the way that you actually see that in JLC PCB, JLC PCB, KiCad, is uh, when you look at it, you'll actually see it as where you don't want the solder mask put. Um, so, you can see here that we obviously don't want it on our pads. Basically anywhere where we want exposed copper, we don't want solder masks because it would be covering it and we wouldn't be able to get at it. Um, but we want it on the rest of the board because we really don't need to make contact with the traces. But in the event that you do need to modify your board, it can be kind of a pain in the butt because then you have to get under the solder mask and actually get to the trace, which is uh, not fun. Um, this next one, the solder paste layer, it's not so much of an actual like discrete layer in the PCB as it's more of just something that gets put into your Gerber manufacturing files that says, hey, there's a, there's a pad here, there needs to be exposed copper. So if we look here, we can see that uh, our front paste layer is all of the exposed pads that we need. And then our back paste layer um, is just our, it's just our vias, basically. Um, and the, the vias are also on the on the front layer too, because you know they're all through hole vias. They go completely through the board. And finally, the last layer I want to talk about is the silk screen layer. And uh, this is this is the fun layer. This is where you get to put all of your text and stuff like that. So you can see that I've got you know retro Benny on here. Hopefully the university doesn't come after me and sue me for that. Um, I've defined, you know, what the different pin functions are. I really should have put what actual pin they are on the microcontroller. With this board right now, you kind of have to open the schematic and figure out which pin it is. Um, so yeah, one thing I would change on this board if I was to do it again. Uh, but you have all your component designators and stuff like that. So you can see, you know, if I turn back on the copper, you know, allows you to see which components go where. 
which if you're going to be hand assembling a board is very helpful. It's not needed. Typically in the industry, you won't have component designators for little passives like this. You will just look at the schematic and go, ah, that is C237, and then figure out what goes in C237 spot. And then maybe you'll have designators for you know ICs and connectors and stuff like that. Um, but generally, boards in industry are so dense, you just really don't have room for designators. Um, but I recommend you put designators on your board. Um, you probably don't need to make it that dense. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about are vias. And vias are how we get a signal from one layer down to the other. Um, it's basically just, you drill a hole in the board and then you plate it with copper, and then you know the electrons are able to flow between the layers, basically. Um, we're only going to be working with through hole vias, and that is a via that's gonna go entirely through the board. Um, there are other types of vias. You can have blind vias where it's drilled from you know the top or the bottom, but it doesn't go all the way through the board. So it's gonna just kind of go through some of the layers and then stop. You can have buried vias, which aren't exposed on the top layers at all. It's just inside the PCB. Um, and the reason that you would have those is that at higher speeds, the actual stubs from the vias, you know, let's say you only need to go from layer one to two, but the via goes all the way through the board, then you've got this giant stub and that can start to cause problems when you're getting into higher speed stuff. The length of that stub actually becomes significant. So uh, they will actually, you know, not have it go all the way through the board. But uh, boards like that are very expensive and you can't get them manufactured at JLC PCB. So I don't recommend doing that. You probably don't need it. Um, and then as far as via sizing goes, we'll go over manufacturer capabilities. But um, there's a lot of different via sizes you can do. You can do micro vias and laser vias, which are very small, which if you're doing something like breaking out a ball grid array, you need really small vias because you need to be able to get in between the you know fine pitch pads of the BGA. But in this case, we don't need super fine vias, um, though I do use the smallest via that JLC PCB will allow because uh, you know, why not? Um, just a couple last things to cover on this board. Um, I have four kind of mounting holes here. I always add mounting holes to my boards um, you know, in case you want to mount it later on. And then I always just, you know, tie them to ground. Um, these right here are tooling holes for JLC PCB. Um, and this is what's needed on their SMT assembly line. Um, they also act as the fiducials, I believe. And fiducials are just marks that are used in manufacturing that kind of allow the pick and place machine to, you know, tell how the board is oriented. Um, at least that's how I understand it. So these are actually included as a part in the project. I created these to be the JLC PCB spec. Um, so yeah, that's it's not really necessarily a, a part of general PCB stuff, but if you're gonna be doing manufacturing on a pick and place machine, um, you're gonna need some kind of fiducials manufacturing markings. And yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the basics of PCB. So in the next video, uh, we are actually going to get into component selection, and then after that, we're going to get into doing some schematics. All right, welcome back for another exciting PCB design video. Uh, today, we are going to be doing part selection. So we're going to be figuring out, you know, how do you choose what microcontroller you need, what kind of regulator do you need, um, you know, all that good stuff. So uh, let's get right in. So as far as finding parts goes. Um, Usually you would probably start on DigiKey, kind of the typical place to start. But if you're having your board developed by JLC PCB, not really developed, manu yeah, manufactured and they're doing the assembly, you're probably gonna need to start with JLC PCB's parts library, which is a little unfortunate because it's kind of bad. And it's not bad in that they don't have a lot of selection. It's bad in that it's not, it's not super organized, I would say. It's kind of hard to navigate. Um, it's a little hard to search and you really have to know what you're looking for and how to use it. And uh, yeah, it's not my favorite. 
So I'm actually gonna spend most of my time in the JLC PCB side because I feel like it's harder and I feel like it's the one that needs the most coverage. DigiKey is super easy. You can just go, oh, oh I'm gonna go to the microcontroller section and then I want these peripherals and I want it to operate at this voltage and I want it to have this max operating speed and it's super easy. Uh, JLC PCB doesn't have that. So uh, let's just start by trying to find a microcontroller. So I recommend that you stick with mainstream microcontrollers. Um, you can get a lot of weird parts on JLC PCB that are made by some strange manufacturers. Don't go that way. You want to get a microcontroller that's gonna have some kind of IDE that has support for it that's easy to use. Um, if you get like a weird knockoff Chinese processor, you're probably gonna have a bad day. So just looking there, um, I would start with looking for STM32, you know, SAMD, which is an Atmel slash microchip uh, processor. I really recommend sticking with STM32 or Atmel. Um, those are kind of the, the big easy ones and those are the ones that I've used. So of course I'm gonna recommend them. So if you just go here and we search STM32, then uh, yeah, get a whole, whole bunch of options that pop up. Um, but what we're gonna wanna do is click the in stock there, that's important. And you'll see they actually have a ton in stock. And one benefit of JLC PCB is that they actually have a ton of parts in stock that you can't get elsewhere. Um, the microcontroller that is on the particular, you know, board that I'm showing you in these videos, I couldn't have gotten it from DigiKey, but I was able to get it from JLC PCB, um, which is really cool. So, you know, it's for little hobbyist projects and stuff like that, you know, they have plenty of stock for you to you know, make five or 10 boards or whatever you need, and uh, it's pretty cool. All right, so once you're in here, um, it's a little hard to sort through parts in JLC PCB. I really don't recommend that you like click on these and then try to go from there. Um, it's kind of ends up being kind of a disaster. What I would start with like, oh, okay, here's an STM32 F103. So STM32 F103. Um, I'm not going to add the, the last part of it. You know, I just want to see what is the STM32 F103? What kind of general family of microcontroller is this? So I'm like, okay, it runs at 72 megahertz. Uh, you know, you can get a wide range of uh, memory in it. It's got USB built in. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of good. And, oh, look, here's a, here's a nice little chart that kind of shows me what I'm looking for. Um, and from here, I'm like, okay, well, I think I want a 48 pin LQFP package. So, you know, STM32 F103C is what I want. You know, maybe, maybe that's the kind of part I'm looking for. F103C. And I look here and I see, you know, F103CBT6, C8 T6. So we have. The CB is going to have more memory than the C8, maybe 64K is enough. What's the price difference between the C8 and the CB? Um, but ah, this one is a basic part. And this is this is something that I want to talk about is JLC PCB has basic parts and they have extended parts. And the idea is that the basic parts are things that they keep in their pick and place machines, you know, pretty much at all times. And when you have them on their board, they don't really have to do much manual intervention. The extended parts are things that they don't really keep, uh, you know, stocked in their machines too much. And uh, they have to actually have one of their workers go and swap it out and yada, 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 all that stuff. And so it makes it a little bit more expensive to have uh, extended parts. Um, so there is there's a little bit of a fee involved. I would recommend that you check what that fee is uh, because it changes. See, okay, so here it is. We charge $3 per extended component. And what that means is, let's say that I decide to go with an extended microcontroller. Then it's, it's just, it's $3 extra added to my order, which really isn't that bad. So let's say that um, you have, you need 20 of them. It's still only $3 added to your total. At least when I ordered my boards, that's how it was. So it's really not that bad. I have, I have some extended components on this board um, and it ended up adding, I think like $20 to my overall cost, but 
you know, if the extended component makes your design a lot easier and you think it makes it more reliable, then, you know, go with the extended component. Um, but in this case, uh, you know, I can reasonably believe that the C8T6 with its, you know, 64K of flash and its 20K of RAM is gonna, is, uh, gonna be enough for my case. So uh, then I would end up going with that. So really the, the thing that you need to be concerned about uh, isn't so much the memory and stuff like that, it's the peripherals when you're looking at a microcontroller. You know, does it have USB? Um, you know, how many I squared C buses do I have? You are at SPI. Does it have an analog to digital converter? Does it have a DAC? Do I need those things? So in the case of this, if we scroll down here, what we can see is we have an analog to digital converter. It's 12 bits. You know, is that enough? That's, that's a pretty good resolution on an analog to digital converter. It's probably going to be enough. Um, we have access to 10 channels. Uh, we have PWM, so that's good. We've got 13 PWM channels. We don't have a digital to analog converter, so if you need to generate analog voltages, um, you would need to get an external digital to analog converter if you were to go with this chip. So that's something to consider. Uh, we've got three US arts. Um, chances are you're probably just gonna use them as a UART. A US art can function as a UART. It's just got some extra stuff for, you know, if you wanna run it as uh, synchronous. It's got SPI, it's got I squared C, and it has USB on it. And it even has CAN. So that's, that's pretty cool. So really the, the biggest downfall that I would say with this microcontroller is that it doesn't have a digital to analog converter. So if that's something that you would want, you would need to go look for a different microcontroller. Now, going back here and uh, looking for STM32, I went in stock and basic parts. I can also say that there's the STM32L151C8T6. And if I click on that, I go here, I go, all right, this one can't run quite as fast. It can only run at 32 megahertz. Um, let's see, we've got 64K of flash, we have 10K of RAM. Oh, we have 14 12-bit ADC channels, and then we have two 12-bit DAC channels. So this one has a DAC on board. Uh, 24 PWM channels, uh, three UARTs, SPI, I squared C, USB, um, no CAN though. So, and it's it's in a 48 pin package too. So these are kind of these are two kind of good options. Um, if you need a DAC, this is probably going to be where you need to go. 32 megahertz is probably fast enough for what you need to do. Um, but this is this is kind of how I'll look for microcontrollers in JLC PCB. Is I'll start with looking for the manufacturer. You know, a manufacturer that I know is reputable, and I'll look at what options JLC PCB has. Now, and if you're willing to go for extended parts, there are a ton of options here. Um, you can get some pretty, you know, some pretty crazy uh, chips. It kind of looks like from JLC PCB. Um, I mean, here's this STM32H7. Uh, yeah, it's a LQFP100. Uh, let's see, thing can run at 480 megahertz. Um, yeah, we've got some digital analog converters, a ton of ADC channels. No PWM though, oddly enough. Uh, UART's an LP UART, I don't even, low power UART, I'm guessing. I, I haven't, didn't even know that was a thing. No USB though, that's that's kind of surprising. So it's it's kind of hit and miss with microcontrollers, but if you take the time, kind of find the one that has the peripherals you need, um, then, you know, it's, it's not too bad. Just take your time and uh, I, I believe you can do it. All right, so the next thing we're gonna look at is choosing some kind of step-down regulator for your board. Chances are you're gonna have like, I don't know, 12 volts as an input, and you wanna step it down to 3.3 volts or five volts or something like that. Um, so let's kind of go over how to find one of those in JLC PCB. And this is where I would like to bring up where uh, their part system is kind of not great. So you look here, we have power management ICs and we have DC to DC converters. But then we also have power supply chip, DC to DC controllers, DC to DC converters. And we're like, wait, why is there 17,951 in here, uh, but there's only 283 in here? Like they're seemingly 
they're seemingly the same thing, right? Um, and apparently not. To JLC, PCB, they're not the same thing. So uh, a lot of the times you'll go, oh yeah, this is, this is what I need. I need power management IC, DC to DC converter. And in my case, on my board, and I know this is a part that JLC PCB has, I'll go LMR16020, and it doesn't even show up because it's not under power management IC's DC to DC converter. Instead, what I have to do to find that part, uh, you know, if, if I was actually looking for it in a subcategory, is go to power supply chip, DC to DC converter, LMR16020. And look, suddenly it's it's here. I'm in another DC to DC converter section. There's multiple DC to DC converter categories in JLC PCB. I have no idea why. It is a disaster. But <laughs> anyway, I recommend that you start in this power supply chip DC to DC converter section. Um, that's where they have most of them. And then from in here, you can sort by in stock. You can go to basic parts if you want to. Um, there's, there's a lot of options here. Regulators are kind of complicated. Um, so I would generally recommend that if you can get something from like Texas Instruments or analog devices or something like that, um, something that's going to have a good data sheet on it that just kind of tells you how to design it, that's going to be the best thing. I also recommend that you get one that has some kind of discontinuous mode of operation. So let's just let's just go ahead and click on one of these. Um, we see here we have a TPS 5430, it's a Texas Instruments part. And let's just scroll down and get a basic idea of uh, you know what this is. The output's adjustable, so it's not a fixed output. Um, our input voltage minimum is 5.5 volts, maximum is 36 volts, so that's a nice big range. Um, being able to have 12 and 24 volt inputs is really nice, so I, I am a big fan of that. Uh, minimum output voltage, and that's just if you tie the feedback pin like directly to the output, um, 1.221 volts. Maximum output, 32 volts, um, so yeah, 3.3 volts and 5 volts lie perfectly within that. The maximum output current is three amps. Now the switching frequency is 500 kilohertz. Um, I think that that's fine. I would recommend that for your switching, you try to find something that's in the 500 kilohertz to kind of like 2.2 megahertz range. Don't go for super low frequency switchers because you're probably gonna need to put a giant inductor on your board. Um, the lower your switching frequency, the bigger you're going to need to make your inductor. Um, in order to keep it in continuous mode and to make it happy. So generally with the types of applications that you have in embedded systems, you probably won't have a super large load on your regulator. I think the load on my five volt regulator for this board is like almost 50 milliamps. It's really tiny. Um, so I went with a fast switcher. I actually went with one that has an adjustable frequency and I'm running it at like 1.5 megahertz. Um, but this one, this one would probably be fine. Um, and then if we go to the data sheet here, you know, it's got your typical schematic here. Um, one thing to look out for is how many external parts does it require? This is a very, a very typical one where you have a bootstrap capacitor, uh, you have your catch diode, your inductor, and then you have your filtering and then your uh, your resistor is on the output to feed it its feedback voltage. Uh, this is pretty typical. Sometimes with bigger buck regulators, you will have the actual uh, pass element, the transistor on the outside, um, which can make the layout more complicated. Sometimes you will have external compensation on the outside. So I believe this is an internally compensated uh, buck regulator, which is nice because then you don't have to worry about trying to calculate the compensation and stuff for it. Um, I really recommend going with an internally compensated regulator. So really just try to stick with something that 
you know, has a schematic that kind of looks like this, and uh, it'll make life a lot easier. Uh, if we go down and we look at kind of the pin description, we see that this has an enable pin. So if you wanted to have the ability to turn this off in your design, or you needed to have like power sequencing, um, an enable pin is, you know, a really important thing. This doesn't have a P good signal output. Um, so that's one thing to consider. P good is basically a signal that will come from regulators that says, hey, I'm good, my rail has come up and I am stable and you can, you can demand power from me. Uh, this doesn't have that, so, but chances are you probably don't need that. All right, and then coming down here to the typical applications, um, we can see here they have a 15 microhenry inductor. Generally, these typical applications will always, def uh, they will always design it for like the maximum output current. And there is something that you should be aware of when you were designing regulators for embedded systems designs where they probably won't consume that much current. And that is that you're probably going to be running in some kind of discontinuous mode of operation unless you put a gigantic inductor on your board. So just doing a quick Google search here, um, here's this article from Imprix. But basically, so ideally when you have your buck regulator running, you've got some kind of ripple current on your output. So you'll see this, this dotted line here is your nominal output current. So, you know, in this case, that would be my 50 milliamps from my board. But the buck regulator itself is constantly, you know, it's switching. So here you have the inductor is conducting. So let's go, let's go back here. So here you'll have that this net right here will be at your input voltage. So let's say it's at 12 volts. So you have 12 volts, this voltage is higher than this voltage, and it is, you know, it's the current is going up that way. The inductor, the current through it is going up, it's raising. And then what happens is this net right here, usually this is, I, you call this your switch node, they're calling it pH. Um, but this is, this is your switch node. Your switch node then goes to zero volts. And then what happens is the current through the inductor is now going to decrease. And then that's what that's what this portion is. So you can see that it's increasing, it's decreasing, it's increasing, it's decreasing, so on and so forth. But if your output current isn't high enough, what you'll notice is that your inductor current would have to go negative. And I, there are some buck regulators that can do this. They can actually sync current um, through their switch pin, I believe, or something like that. But it, it has to go discontinuous is what it is. And in this mode of operation, you wanna make sure that the regulator actually has a discontinuous mode of operation. So look in here, it looks like this regulator does define kind of some kind of discontinuous conduction mode, um, but it doesn't really say what it looks like, so it makes me a little bit wary. So if I was, you know, had a low power application, this probably wouldn't be my first choice, but it would probably be okay. Um, going to the regulator that I have chosen, the LMR16020. We go here to discontinuous mode. It actually defines that, hey, I have a discontinuous mode, um, you know, and it's, you, know, you can use it and it's totally cool. Um, and so it allows you to confidently use a small inductor that is, you know, smaller than the equations will tell you that you need and use that regulator and use it in that discontinuous mode. Um, otherwise, when you do these equations for choosing an inductor, uh, you're gonna get a pretty big inductor. So I have a 4.7 microhenry inductor on the board right now. Um, and if I was to use these equations to design it to keep it in the continuous mode, I would need a 130 microhenry inductor or something like that. Like it's a crazy big inductor, which means that it's going to physically have to be larger because there's more windings in there. And it also means that the design is now not going to be able to probably operate at higher currents. Like let's say I wanted to connect, um, you know, a load to the five volts that's external to the board. I probably can't use one that that's, that is that big because the, uh, 
the inductor itself probably won't be rated for that high of a current. Um, it's easy to get low value inductors that are rated for high currents in small packages than is to get, you know, really high value inductors that are rated for high currents. So I generally recommend just get some kind of buck regulator that has a discontinuous mode of operation and then go through the design and design it for your input and output voltage and define it for its maximum output current and everything will probably be fine. Um, there are other parts that you need to select when you're doing a buck regulator. So you need to select the inductor, your catch diode, your filtering. We're gonna go over that in the schematic section. I'm not going to worry about doing that in this particular video. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about choosing the main meat and potatoes ICs. And then maybe the last regulator you might want is a linear regulator, an LDO. Uh, these are pretty nice. What I'll usually do is I'll have a buck regulator step down to some voltage that's, you know, in the range of what I need for my microcontroller. In this case, I step down to five volts and then I'll feed that into a linear regulator. Um, so if we go here to linear regulators, LDO, uh, we go in stock. Uh, I ended up going with the AMS 1117-33, or no, no, I went with the basic part. What a, there it is. I, another example of JLC PCBs awesome part system. I think the other one was just from a different manufacturer. Um, but I ended up going with this guy. So uh, input voltage, 15 volts, output voltage, it's fixed to 3.3. It has a dropout of 1.3 volts. So supplying that with five volts is gonna be plenty. Um, notice here that this regulator is rated for an amp. Yeah, it's rated for an amp, but they only specify the voltage dropout at 800 milliamps. So if you're going to run it at an amp, uh, you need to go to the data sheet, look at the dropout curve and make sure it's actually, you know, you're giving it enough voltage because uh, that is important. So this is, this is a fine regulator. The one trap that I want to make you aware of with these regulators, some of these cheaper ones, is that they are not designed to work with newer capacitors. So newer ceramic capacitors are extremely low ESR. They have very low equivalent series resistance. The problem is some of these older linear regulators are not stable with low ESR caps. So if we go here and uh, we look for capacitor, you'll notice here that on the output, they specify a 22 microfarad output cap and it looks like it's some kind of polarized capacitor and they recommend to use tantalum capacitors, which means that they're wanting something that's got a little bit more equivalent series resistance to it. So if you threw ceramic capacitors on this for the output filter, it might not be stable. So let's say you've got some kind of transient that happens, your voltage might just go all over the place, which is no fun. Um, but you don't wanna rule these regulators out because they're usually very abundant and they're usually very cheap. So the, the fix that I had for this, and um, I know we're going into the schematic here when this isn't the schematic video, but basically I just added equivalent series resistance. I went, okay, here's two 10 microfarad, I believe these are 1206 caps. Uh, I'm just gonna add an ohm in, in series with them. I'm just gonna add a 0603 resistor in series with them, call it a day. And uh, the board works fine with this, and this is something that you'll see a lot. Now, would it probably work fine without this equivalent series resistance? It probably would, um, but I went ahead and added it here. And then as far as the 0.1 microfarad not having the ESR, not adding that ESR to it, um, it's usually, it, it's a little complicated, but if you actually do the stability analysis, having this high value capacitor with the resistance added in place with it uh, actually makes it stable. And then this 0.1 microfarad cap here doesn't end up really mattering from the stability standpoint, or at least that's how I understand it. I'm sure I'm not completely getting that right. But basically 
your low value, high frequency filtering cap, we'll talk more about those later. Uh, you don't need to worry so much about adding the ESR to that. It's really the, the big caps that you wanna make sure you add some ESR to. And the way I did it is I just kind of thought, well, somewhere in the range of an ohm of equivalent series resistance, you know, a few hundred milliohms to an ohm is probably good. So what I've done here is I basically have a 20 microfarad cap with about 500 milliohms of ESR because I've got the two resistors in parallel. So, um, and that seems to, uh, to work totally fine. Hello, it's me from the future, and I realized that I did not talk about choosing something to actually clock your microcontroller. Um, there are microcontrollers that have internal clock sources, but I don't recommend you use them. So if you're gonna externally clock your microcontroller, you have two options. Uh, you can use a crystal resonator like this, or you can use an external clock as long as your microcontroller supports it. If you do go with a crystal like this, uh, it's a passive device, so you don't supply it power, and you have to choose things like loading caps, potentially this external resistor, and it's a little bit less guaranteed to work. If you have a microcontroller that allows an external clock source, I recommend that you just feed it an external clock using a active oscillator. So I'm not even gonna talk about the crystal resonator here, I'm just gonna talk about the external clock. So this is the external clock that I used on my board, the external oscillator I chose. This is the JLC PCB category it's under. They've got a lot of different weird categories for oscillators and stuff, but this one seems to have the most options. So what you wanna make sure is when you are looking for a high-speed external clock, an external oscillator, you wanna make sure that it's going to be within the specifications of your microcontroller. So the duty cycle, you know, make sure that it has the right duty cycle, make sure that it is in this accepted frequency range, that's important. Eight megahertz is always, you know, a really safe bet uh, and that this voltage level is correct and that it's also going to be operating at the correct voltage. So if we look at the data sheet for the one that I have selected, you'll see that there's different options. You can get them for different operating voltages uh, but the symmetry is correct. The uh, output high and low is within the tolerances of my microcontroller. And really the most important thing is going to be the symmetry, which should be correct, and uh, the, the operating voltage and the frequency, making sure that you're in that correct frequency range, which this eight megahertz oscillator is. So yeah, that's, that's how you choose something to clock your microcontroller. So yeah, basically the to summarize this whole thing, for your microcontroller, just figure out what type of peripherals you need and then get a microcontroller that has those peripherals. For your buck regulator, I recommend get something that's, you know, above 500 kilohertz, 500 kilohertz to 2.2 megahertz so that you can have a smaller inductor and get something that has a defined discontinuous operation mode so that if you've got really light loads, it'll still operate okay. Maybe the signal's a little dirtier, but it's probably gonna be fine. Um, and then for linear regulators, you don't have to be as careful, but if it's not designed to work with ultra low ESR caps, you're gonna to wanna to add some kind of equivalent series resistance there. And you also wanna make sure for, for all of your regulators that you are you know have the proper amount of input capacitance and output capacitance, and you can kinda of look at the data sheet to figure that out it will usually allow you to calculate what value of capacitors you need. And that's important from a filtering standpoint, but also from a stability standpoint. So I know that uh, that was kind of a lot. We're gonna talk more about this stuff in the schematics video, but this will hopefully give you a general idea of how you can go about choosing your, your meat and potatoes parts. So it is finally time to start getting into the actual design of our board. Uh, hopefully you've picked you know, a couple parts right now. You don't have to have everything fleshed out, but hopefully you've got a microcontroller and you've got some way to power it, and now it's time to kind of stitch it all together. So instead of going through and doing a schematic step-by-step -step with you, I'm going to go over the schematic that I've made, kind of each individual section, and tell you why I've done things the way that I have and why I designed it that way and I think that it'll be a little bit faster and you're hopefully gonna get more out of it. So let's kind of get started. So the first place that I recommend that you start in your schematic with 
an embedded PCB is I kind of just recommend that you start with your microcontroller chip. So in JLC PCB, chances are your microcontroller should hopefully already be in here. If I search for STM32, F, oh my God, F103. Sorry, I had like a weird, I don't even know what that was. Uh, F103, C8, T6. Uh, you'll notice that that six at the end doesn't look like it really matters. If you went to the data sheet, you can verify that. Uh, you'll see that that part already exists in here. They have a footprint for it. Uh, they have a symbol for it. And, you know, it's the correct package. Uh, and, yeah, and then from there, you can just import the symbol and you can place it. And, uh, you know, then you're, you're all good to go. So once you do that, usually what I will do is I will... Uh, connect my power first. So we've got three different types of power pins on this microcontroller. We've got a VBAT pin, we've got VDD, and then we've got VDDA. So VBAT is for, it's like if you have a battery backup you want to connect. Uh, typically, if you don't want to connect the battery backup, you just want to tie it directly to 3.3 uh, with a, a filtering cap. Filtering cap probably isn't necessary, but usually I'll put a filtering cap anyway. The VDD pins are your typical, just your power pins. They're for your digital circuitry. This is mostly what the chip uses for its power. It's also why there's three of them. And then the VDDA pin is going to be for your analog supply. So that's gonna be for your analog to digital converter, your digital to analog converter. And it's really important that this pin is clean because changes in voltage on that pin are going to directly affect you know, your measurements and all that stuff. Whereas, you know, let's say you've got uh, 50 millivolts of ripple on your VDD pins. Well, if that amount of ripple isn't enough to, you know, cause an error in your logic levels or stuff like that, like who cares? Who cares if you have 50 millivolts of ripple? But 50 millivolts of ripple on VDDA, that's gonna be multiple bits of error, so, um, Really what you want to do is you want to go to the data sheet for your microcontroller and I recommend that you look at what kind of filtering they recommend. Now generally, for VDD pins, for your digital supply pins or your VBAT pin, it's going to be really easy. You're just going to put a 0.1 microfarad cap per pin and you want a 0.1 microfarad cap per pin right next to the pin um, and that is going to basically provide high frequency filtering for that pin. Um, and then the VDDA pin is usually going to have more extensive filtering. So you'll notice that for this pin right here, I have three different capacitor values. I have a 0.1, or I have a 0.1 microfarad still, but then I have a 10 nanofarad, and that is for really high frequency decoupling. And then I have a one microfarad cap, which is going to still be, you know, it's not quite as high frequency. But basically what I'm doing is I'm able to filter a wider range of frequencies. Um, and let's just, let's just take a second to find out kind of why we have multiple different capacitor values and why we don't just use one big capacitor. Because you know, what you learn in school is the big capacitor looks like a really low resistance to the, to the, to the alternating current and ah, and it's unfortunately it's not quite like that. So let's, let's take a little sidetrack here. All right, so the tool that I'm pulling up here is the Murata Sim Surfing tool. This is an awesome tool um, that allows you to kind of see the different characteristics of capacitors. And it allows you to see the characteristics of real capacitors. These are capacitors that don't just have capacitance, right? You've got resistance, you've got inductance, um, and you, know, you have voltage derating. And it is very important that you understand how all those different things function in a capacitor. So let's just look here. Let's say I want a 10 microfarad cap. Um, I want it rated at I don't know, 25 volts. And I want an 0805 uh, package. Okay, so I have a 10 microfarad, 25 volt rated cap, 0805. Uh, let's first look at the CDC bias. So what this chart is showing us is how the capacitance of the capacitor changes as the voltage goes up. So we've got this 10 microfarad cap. Well, yeah, it voltages below 1.5 volts 
you know, or at 1.5 volts, it operates as a 10 microfarad cap. But let's go to 3.3 volts. At 3.3 volts, it's a 7.6 microfarad cap. At 5 volts, it's a 5.5 microfarad cap. Like, what the heck? And at 25 volts at its maximum voltage rating, it's not even a 1 microfarad cap anymore. So, like, what the heck? So that's the first thing I want you to be aware of is voltage derating. Now, the way that you can get around this, like, uh, for instance, I have 10 microfarad caps on my input power, and I know this, this is kind of, kind of a sidetrack from the microcontroller, but while we're talking about capacitors, might as well. I have 10 microfarad caps here on my input, but you'll notice that they are a 1206 package. And so you look here, if we go for a cap that is rated for 50 volts in a 1206 package, we go here at 3.3 volts, you know, it is like actually a 10 microfarad cap. Um, and then if we go to 12 volts, which is what my input voltage is, you know, this one is a, it's a four microfarad cap, but still way better than the like one point whatever microfarads the 0805 25 volt cap was. So really this voltage rating here, that's, that is your maximum voltage. That's the absolute maximum you can put on the cap, but you really don't want to use that as, uh, you know, you don't want to apply that voltage to the cap and uh, you want to understand that this 10 microfarad here is only going to be in a very, you know, a very small range. And then after that, all of it goes to hell. And you can see here with the, the 0805 uh, 50 volt cap, you can see that 3.3 volts, it's only 8.5 microfarads. Instead, the, the 1206 was an actual legit 10 microfarad cap at 3.3 volts. And then here at 12 volts, like, oh, Oh, look at that, 12 volts. This one is 2.78 microfarads. 2.78 microfarads at 12 volts. And the 1206 was uh, about four microfarads. So, you know, quite a bit higher. Um, so keep that in mind, the size, the voltage rating. And really what I recommend you do is when you end up doing your power stuff, go into SimSurfing. Um, you're not gonna have this exact Mirada cap, but it's going to give you a general good idea. I really, you should probably select the general purpose one and then go from there. Um, and that's probably going to give you the best idea. But as you can see, it's it's still about the same. 3.3 volts, we're at 10 microfarads at, uh, oh, here at 12 volts. Wow, we're actually quite a bit higher. Okay, so yeah, make, make sure you actually select the general purpose because, uh, wow, that can change by quite a bit. I had not realized how much that could change just from, yeah, okay, well, I don't know if this notes here derating one has anything to do with it, but I recommend you select the general purpose cap, and then it's probably going to be about what the capacitance of your, you know, whatever capacitor you get from JLC PCB is. Okay, anyway, moving, moving back from that sidetrack, um, Wow, we didn't actually talk about the frequency thing. Okay, let's go back to SimSurfing. <laughs> All right, back in SimSurfing, I'm gonna select general purpose. Um, we're gonna go 10 microfarad, and let's go, we'll go 0805, sure. Actually, here, let's go, let's go 1206. And 50 volt, sure. All right, so here's our general purpose, 10 microfarad, 50 volt cap. You'd, might be thinking, that's a big cap, that's gonna filter tons of noise. So let's go here to uh, our frequency characteristics. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to this impedance versus frequency curve. And what you'll notice here is that here we're operating as we'd expect, right? The higher the frequency, the lower the impedance because it's a capacitor. But then we get to here and then boop, it starts going back up. So what, ideally, you know, our capacitor would just keep going down, keep going down infinitely low. The higher the frequency, the lower the impedance. The problem is that it, it doesn't actually work that way. <laughs> so once you get to this point, the inductance in the capacitor starts to take over. And now the capacitor uh, starts to look like a very high impedance because that, you know, series, reduct, uh, series inductance that you have with it starts to become large enough that, you know, the little 
resistance of the capacitor that you have in front of it like doesn't even matter anymore. So basically up to, you know, about two, just under two megahertz, this cap operates quickly. It will filter at like one point, you know, 1.5 megahertz, that's like it's, that's its golden frequency. It filters really good at that. Um, but after that, like, no, it start, starts going back up here. And uh, after this region, you know, who knows? And you shouldn't have noise that's up here in your board probably, but you know, uh, 1.5 megahertz isn't that high. I mean, if you've got a switcher that is switching at two megahertz, like, you know, this, this will still probably be fine at filtering it out. Um, but you know, you have the harmonics from that switcher that are going to be at higher frequencies and they're gonna be up here in this region and this isn't going to do as good of a job at filtering those out. So to counteract that, what we do is we choose a wide range of capacitors. So let's go now to a 0.1 microfarad cap. So we'll go 0.1 microfarad, uh, should we leave it at 50 volt, and then I'm going to select an 0402. So 0.1 microfarad, 50 volt, 0402. And then we go back to this curve and look at that. Look at that. We don't hit this kind of resonant frequency up here until like 30 megahertz, right? So down, down here in this region, it's, you know, it's not as great. Um, you'll remember that the 10 microfarad cap was significantly lower impedance in this region. But then here, once we get up into this region where, you know, right here at this like two megahertz mark was where the 10 microfarads started to go to crap, this one starts to take over. So we've got them in parallel and we've got a wide range of filtering. And you can see that the resonant frequency here is like 28 megahertz. And then you'll notice that on our analog pin, we also have a 10 nanofarad. So if we go here and go 10 nanofarad, so we'll just go like that. You can also call it a 10,000 picofarad if you really want to. We go here and we look at this and look at this resonant for you. We're way the hell up here at like 90 megahertz. So that's why we will take multiple different values of capacitor and you'll put them in parallel with each other to filter a wide range of noise. Um, the first time I saw this, this was like eye-opening. I was like, oh, that's that's why we use a wide you know range of capacitors and we don't just stick a giant 220 microfarad cap on the board. Um, so yeah, that's that's why that's done that way. So basically for the VDD and VBAT pins, 0.1 microfarad is gonna be fine. The data sheet will probably tell you to have some larger kind of bulk decoupling capacitance somewhere near the chip. I just chose a 10 microfarad cap for that. I believe I used an 0805 there because um, it's it's only 3.3 volts and I wasn't super worried about it. Um, and then VDDA, you'll want to look at the data sheet and it'll probably have you, you know, set up a, some kind of specific circuit. In this case, the STM32 data sheet told me to choose these values. And then on some microcontrollers, you'll actually have an LC filter there on the, uh, on the VDDA pin. So I just kind of recommend that you do whatever the data sheet tells you and it's probably gonna be fine. So after that, um, there might be some pins on the data sheet that you need to set up correctly to configure them. So for instance, we have this boot zero pin here. Uh, there's also a boot one pin, which you can choose to use or not use. But basically, in this case, the boot pins on this microcontroller tell it uh, where it's actually going to be loading the program from. And I just tied this to ground because uh, I always want it to be loading from flash. So one thing that's kind of actually annoying, so if you go and you try to look for how to use the boot pins in the data sheet, it's like, yeah, so the boot pins can be used to load, uh, you know, boot from flash from system memory or embedded SRAM. And you're like, oh, that's sick. How do I, how do I configure them? And I couldn't actually find it in this data sheet. If you look for boot, there isn't actually a table anywhere that tells you how you should use the boot pins, um, which is really annoying. So instead what you have to do is you have to go find a different document, which in this case is the hardware design guide, um, 
STM32 tends to have these. You have to go to this hardware design guide, and these are great. These will tell you um, generally how you should do your power supply scheme, so you can see you know, how it recommends you do your different filtering and stuff like that. But here, now you can finally find the boot mode configuration. And you can see that if you ground boot zero, it'll boot from main flash memory and then the boot one pin doesn't even matter. So yeah, this is probably what you're gonna wanna do is you're just wanna, gonna wanna boot from main flash memory. But if you want more flexibility, you can also tie the boot pins to a switch. I just didn't do that because I didn't see a reason to on this board. But you will want to go through the different uh, kind of configuration pins on the board like those boot pins look at the data sheet or whatever weird document they have you find and then configure them to however you need. Uh, another one here is the reset pin. So if we go to the data sheet and we look for the reset pin, in this case, there is an internal pull-up resistor. So here we see it is connected to a permanent pull-up resistor. And basically the way this pin works is you ground it and it resets the microcontroller. So uh, in this case, you know, I've got the reset pin connected to a switch here. You connect the switch and it grounds it. And if you're not familiar with the concept of pull-up resistors, basically you've got, you know, this pin here, there's a resistor in there that is pulling it up to a voltage. And because that pin isn't really drawing any current, you don't have any voltage drop across that resistor and the microcontroller just reads it as whatever voltage it's tied up to. But if you then ground that pin, it's directly connected to ground, and then you have you know, a path for current to flow from where that resistor is tied up to down to ground, you have a voltage drop across it, so you know, you're going to see that it's connected to ground, and the microcontroller goes, oh, the pin's connected to ground, you know, reset, basically. And you'll see the concept of pull-up resistors used in a lot of places. Um, we'll also talk about them with the I2C bus, because we've got them there too. And then here you can actually see that with the boot zero pin, I didn't just tie it directly to ground. Um, I probably could have just tied it directly to ground, but I just used a pull down resistor because um, if I wanted to disconnect this pin, I could take the resistor out and then I could connect the pin high if I wanted to. Versus if I just connected this directly with a trace, then I'd have to go and actually cut that trace or I'd have to like pry the pin of the microcontroller up and that's, that's just not a fun time. Now, for figuring out what to connect all the other pins to, you can go to the data sheet if you want, but if you're using an STM32 or another chip that has this feature, if you actually go into the IDE, it's got this nice graphical user interface that you can use for assigning the pins, um, which I think is pretty sweet. Um, so you can just, you can select a pin and you can see what different functionality it has, which is just, it, it makes it a lot easier, in my opinion. Here, I basically went and I've assigned what functionality I think people would use this pin for on a breakout board. But most of these pins have multiple different functionalities that you, know, you can use them as. So that is nice because when it comes to actually doing your layout, uh, it allows you to have a lot of flexibility and put what pins you want where so that it's easiest to do your layout and routing. Um, and yeah, it just, it kind of, it kind of takes care of a lot of the thinking for you. Um, I really recommend that you start in the IDE for choosing your pins here. Um, the other thing in the part selection, we talked about, you know, choosing an oscillator. This is also where you can go into clock configuration um, and you can set up your, you know, your clock tree and stuff like that. But one thing that we can do is we can go into system core, we can go into RCC, high speed clock, and we can set it as a bypass clock source and kind of verify that yes, uh, we could use a crystal ceramic resonator if we wanted, or we can just feed this, you know, an output from an active oscillator and we can clock it that way. So that's the next step I recommend you do is get into your IDE and figure out, you know, what pins you want to use for what functionality. And if you end up trying to do something that's illegal, the IDE will probably tell you like, hey, you can't do that. If you don't have the option to do this in an IDE, uh, you have to go into the data sheet and do it. 
And so basically you're just gonna be looking at the pin table in the data sheet and going, okay, yeah, that, that pin has UART on it. I need a UART, so I'm gonna use these two pins for UART. You can do that, just be careful that you don't end up trying to use a pin for two functionalities. So, you know, if you have a pin that has UART and I squared C, like don't try to use UART and I squared C on that pin. Use UART on that pin or I squared C on that pin and then go to some other set of pins for the other functionality. And if you can't do that, you probably need a different microcontroller. Now, regardless of what functionality you have on your board, I 100% recommend that you put a test LED on your board and I recommend that you set it up kind of like this. The reason is that the pins on your microcontroller, especially with newer ones, are not designed to source very much current. Um, so I usually recommend that you do something like this. If you only want to run like a milliamp through the LED, you don't need to do this. And that's normally what I'd do is run a milliamp. I decided to run five milliamps through these LEDs. I don't really know why. Uh, I just kind of felt like doing it, because why not? So in that case, I needed to uh, do kind of this little switch here. So basically the way this works is this is just a, you know, NMOS transistor. And uh, when this pin goes high, then the gate is higher than the source. This basically shorts itself between its source and its drain, and then current can flow through the LED and it lights up. Now, when this pin is grounded, or if it's open, and I say when it's open because I have this little pull-down resistor here, then the gate is not higher than the source, and then this is an open circuit, no current flows, no light gets emitted. And then the reason that I have this little series resistor here, this is probably unnecessary. Um, it is unnecessary, <laughs> but the transistor here has some amount of gate capacitance that has to be charged. So let's say that that gate is totally discharged. Effectively, what happens is this goes high and a bunch of current's gonna flow in and then it'll slowly dwindle down. Um, so if you don't have this resistor here, the amount of current that flows in to charge up that small amount of gate capacitance could you know, be relatively high. It's also going to be very short-lived. The gate capacitance here is gonna be in like the, the picofarads usually, I'm pretty sure. So it's gonna be pretty tiny. Um, but uh, you know, I generally recommend including some series resistance here, slow that edge down and uh, you know, don't put more stress on your microcontroller than you need to. Um, and this 220 ohms that I chose is really pretty arbitrary. Um, you know, if you do the actual math, this would turn, you know, come out to like a maximum of 15 milliamps flowing through here for a very short period of time. Um, so that might seem like too high and you might feel like you want to put like a larger resistor here, but really 220 ohms is like kind of just a good general value to slap on the gate there and uh, just kind of slow down how fast the current gets sucked from that pin. Um, one thing that you'll notice I've done is all of these pins here, I haven't really directly connected them to anything except for the test LED, but I've kind of done these, uh, these little tags here, these labels basically. Um, and I kind of, you know, there's some debate here, but I kind of like doing it this way because then I can organize my schematic a little bit better. Like here's USB, and so, you know, I break USB out over here and have the connector. Uh, here's SWD. So I've got the SWD connector over there. We'll talk about SWD in a little bit. Here's my headers and all the connections there. And it just makes it very clean. Here's my oscillator and all that stuff. Um, so actually, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is actually programming the microcontroller. And normally, you're going to probably be using serial wire debug. Um, you can use JTAG and a big JTAG connector if you want, but serial wire debug is nice because you can implement it in this 10 pin connector. There's a lot of programmers that support it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty good standard. So if we go on the data sheet here, you can see that we have serial, dire, the serial wire debug or JTAG interfaces. Um, and I generally recommend that you just go with that serial wire debug interface if you go back into your IDE 
and uh, you go to system, you can go to debug, and you can select which debug you want. Uh, I recommend you do this trace asynchronous serial wire. And what that does is it uh, gives you your, let's go back to smack here. It'll give you this SWDIO, which is your uh, data in and out for the actual programming. And it'll give you your serial wire clock. You have to have those. But it will also give you access to this SWO pin. That's a serial wire output. And so that's actually an output that if you have the board connected to your programmer, um, you can actually use like putty and you can uh, do output to that pin and you can actually look at it and you're basically using your programmer as a interface. So even if your uh, board doesn't have USB on it, and let's say you don't wanna buy a UART to USB converter, you can use this SWO pin to actually have output to a terminal, which is really nice, really nice for debugging. No one wants to use the debugger. Everyone just wants to print F to the screen. So, you know, that's a, it's a nice pin to have. And for the pinout of this SWD, uh, you can just use this pinout. Um, this is the general SWD pinout. Now the actual programmer that I have isn't a legit SWD standard programmer. It has a weird pinout, it's from China. But basically what I can do is I can connect the 3.3 volt here, I connect the ground here, and then on the programmer, I connect the SWDIO and the SW clock lines, and uh, it totally works fine. But I recommend that you use this standard serial wire debug connector on your board. So if in the future you get a legitimate non-Chinese knockoff programmer, it just kind of works. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the actual oscillator. I'm going to assume that you went with an external active oscillator. I really recommend you do that. You can go with a crystal if you want, but the external active oscillator is just kind of a foolproof solution. So in this case, uh, we only need to use the oscillator in pin. Now, keep in mind that even when we configure the oscillator for the bypass source, uh, this oscillator out pin still can't really be used for anything else from what I can tell. I don't think you're allowed to like use it for something else, um, nor would I recommend you do. You're only going to be using the oscillator in pin and you're just going to feed the output of your oscillator directly into that oscillator in pin. And you can see that set up actually on the data sheet or the hardware description guide. Yeah, so if we look here, we can see external clock. You just have external horse external horse, external source directly into the oscillator in pin. And then over here on the right, you'll see that if we actually have a crystal, then, you know, we've got to worry about load caps and, you know, this external resistor here. And no, we just want to feed the clock directly in there. That's the easiest way to do it. Now, for whatever oscillator you chose, um, if you have an output enable pin, you're going to want to tie that however it needs to be tied. Some of these have active low output enable pins, so you actually need to tie them to ground. Um, in this case, I have one that is active high, so I have it tied to 3.3 volts, again, through a 10K pull-up. Um, I have a 0.1 microfarad filtering cap here. Pretty much any time you have an integrated circuit, at a bare minimum, throw a 0.1 microfarad cap on there. Um, just do it. Use, a, use the 0.1 microfarad cap. Just do it. Don't, don't skip it. Um, and then from there, we just have the output, you know, coming from out of the oscillator there. And that's, uh, that's pretty foolproof. Uh, the reset switch up here, uh, I just have a basic switch symbol here. We'll choose footprints for all of these later on for the parts that don't have footprints. Um, if that's something you've been wondering, you'll notice you're like, okay, what size are these capacitors? Uh, we'll choose all of that later when we go to the schematic. But for now, I just put a general switch in here. And that's one thing that I like about KiCad is you don't necessarily have to worry too much when you're doing the schematic about, okay, what, what actual part am I going to be using here right now? You can just kind of design your schematic and go, I know I need a switch here. I don't really care what it looks like. I just know I need some kind of switch. Um, and yeah, uh, we've got the USB here. So I'm assuming you'll probably want USB on your board. It is really nice to be able to have USB. Um, because you can just, you know, open putty and you can get output from your board and stuff like that. Um, in KiCad, so USB is a differential pair. 
And so what that means is when one of the signals is high, the other one is low and you know, so on and so forth. And that's really great for you know, noise immunity. It makes them uh, very immune to noise. So what'll usually happen is if you have noise in your environment, it propagates onto both of the signals. And then when it actually gets to the receiver, it subtracts out that common node noise. So if there's noise that was on both lines, it gets subtracted out and you basically don't see the noise. Um, and then also it helps to keep the noise from those signals contained in themselves. So differential pairs are really sweet. You wanna take advantage of them. And if you're gonna do that in KiCad, you need to properly notate them. So in this case, USB has a positive signal and the negative signal. You can see that from the D plus and the D minus. The way that you notate a differential pair in KiCad is with underscore P and underscore N, or you can do underscore plus and underscore minus if you want to. Um, and then, you know, we just go from there and then we put it to whatever pin we want on our microcontroller. So we have underscore P, underscore N. And uh, this is a, a very generic USB micro B connector. Um, I recommend you just go with USB 2.0 micro B. You can go with USB C if you want, but chances are you're going to need an additional USB chip. Even if your chip has USB on board, um, it's probably set up for just, you know, USB 2.0. So I recommend that you just use a USB 2.0 standard connector uh, and make it easy. Uh, tie shield and ground together. I recommend that you ground shield. This is something that you'll see, you know, anyone in industry do. Uh, it's, you know, better for EMI and all that. And it's just generally good practice. The V bus pin here. So this actually allows us to get five volts from USB if we want to. Um, and in this case, we have a little shock key diode here. And what that does is you can kind of think of this as like a max out circuit. So we've got the USB power coming from in here and then over on our power schematic, we've got the five volts coming from our buck regulator. And so the way that this works is if we have the five volts coming from our buck regulator, we're gonna have five volts here, we have five volts here, and the shock key diode is just not really going to allow any current to flow from here. And it's also not going to allow current to flow backwards. So we have five volts here and 4.8 volts here, we're not gonna end up like shorting, you know, basically to the USB. Um, and then if we had, you know, a higher voltage here and a lower voltage here, it's just, it's going to limit this voltage to, you know, the forward voltage of this diode. So basically this makes it so that you could connect USB to this board and you could also connect the main power to this board and they're not going to, you know, fight with each other and you're not gonna get a weird short going on. Um, so. If you're going to connect power from USB, which I recommend you do, it's nice to just be able to plug your board in USB and have power, put the shock key diode there. I recommend you use a shock key diode because you're gonna have a lower forward voltage drop. Um, so, you know, we'll have, uh, you know, five volts here, and then, you know, maybe a 0.6 or 0.7 volt voltage drop across there. Um, and, you know, it's not too bad. Um, you'll see that I have a comment here that says MCU has built-in USB termination. So uh, a lot of the STM32 microcontrollers have built-in termination for the USB, so you don't need to worry about having inline resistors or anything like that, which is good. You can just go straight from your connector to the microcontroller and you don't have to worry about it. Now, if you don't have those built-in termination resistors, chances are you're going to need to add some sort of series termination resistors. It's usually like 27 ohms for USB. If you need them, look at the data sheet for your microcontroller. And if it's, you know, a good mainstream microcontroller, it's probably going to tell you exactly what resistors you need to put in series with it, or if you need to put anything in parallel with the lines. Um, so just look at your data sheet and figure out if you need termination for USB or not. And really for any high speed signals like that, you want to determine if you need termination or not. But USB is like the really important one. So the, uh, the next signal that I would like to talk about is I squared C. So this is a really popular one because, you know, you've just got a single data line, a single clock line, and you can string a bunch of devices up to it. And uh, that's pretty cool. One thing that a lot of people forget is that I squared C is, uh, 
you know, it's an open drain configuration, so you need pull-up resistors. If you don't know what open drain means, essentially, uh, when the line needs to be high, the master doesn't actually drive that pin high. It just leaves it open. And then when it needs to pull it low, then it actually grounds the pin. Basically, you've got a transistor here, and when it's off, it's the pin is floating, and when the transistor is on, the pin is grounded. And that's what an open drain configuration is because the drain of that transistor is open. Um, and so because of that, you need pull-up resistors on I squared C. So uh, 4.7K is a really typical value. It should work fine for you. Um, if you're wanting to do really high speed I squared C stuff, um, there are some different calculations that you can do to figure out uh, what range of pull-up resistor you want. Because if your pull-up resistor is too high of a value, then when the, uh, like let's say the signal needs to swing high, well then it has to charge through whatever your pull-up resistance is. And if it's too high, that could be a problem. Chances are if you're just doing generalized squared C stuff and it doesn't need to explicitly be high speed, 4.7K is gonna be fine. Um, but otherwise you might need to get lower. You might need to get down to like 1.5K. Um, and then you've gotta be careful because you need to make sure that your device can actually sync that much current. But chances are 4.7K is gonna work totally fine for you. And you'll have a pull up on both the clock line and on the data line. They're both an open drain configuration. So just remember that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's really common for microcontrollers to ever include those internally. Don't make the mistake of thinking that you can use the internal pull-up resistors in the microcontroller for I squared C. Those are very high value pull-up resistors, They're usually like 100K or something like that. Uh, that's way too large of a resistance for I squared C. The rising edges are going to be way too slow. It's not going to work. Use the external pull-up resistors. And you can see here on the headers that I just kind of connected all these different pins here. Um, now, it might seem like I did this in a seemingly random fashion, but I didn't. Uh, one thing that I want to stress so much is that your schematic and your layout and your routing are all intertwined. When you're doing your schematic, especially when you're dealing with tons of signals like this, you really need to be thinking about your routing. So the way that I ended up connecting these headers, and a breakout board is kind of has like the most spaghetti of any project because you are, you're breaking all of the signals out, is I'd actually go here into the STM32 cube IDE and let's see, it's just, yeah, get, get rid of that. Um, and I go here and I go, okay, how do I want to orient this microcontroller? Well, I think I want USB coming in from the left side so I'd actually rotate the microcontroller in STM32 cube to get it to the, the rotation that I wanted. And then I go, okay, so I've got USB coming out this way. And then how is it gonna lay on the board? Well, I'm gonna probably have it laying here with like USB coming out up here. And then I'm gonna have headers on the side of it. And so what you'll actually notice here is that uh, I basically have the board set up for, you know, how it's going to, I, I'm really thinking about where the signals need to go and I wanna keep the path of the signals as easy as possible. And actually I'm gonna flip this up because in this, in this configuration, this is like looking up. So we've got USB coming out up here and then I'm like, okay, well I've got all these different signals here and you know, I've got them coming down. And then basically I just kind of went, well, I want these signals to just have an unimpeded path to their header. And that's kind of how I, how I routed this basically. Um, there was a little bit of trial and error, but I set it up so that, you know, I've got a header here, a header here, a header here, a header here. And I just tried to make it as easy as possible for all those signals to get to their headers. And Really the kind of starting point I chose is I went, well, this signal right here is going to be like the absolute most bottom right signal. And you'll notice here that it is the most bottom right signal. 
And then I just kind of went around the board from there um, until I had all the signals in a fashion that I felt like they would route nicely. And the result of that, if we go to the PCB, is that when I routed these signals out, uh, it was very easy to get them out of the board. They're not like crisscrossing each other. They're not going through a ton of vias. It's very easy to get them out. I've got a couple signals going through vias here um, just because of space reasons, but I tried to limit how many vias I needed to use and it made it very clean to get all of these signals out of here. So highly recommend you do that. Think about your layout and your routing when you're doing your schematic. And as far as the microcontroller goes, um, that's, that's kind of it. Um, a lot of these other signals here, PWM, SPI, uh, you know, all that stuff. Uh, there's not as many quirks with them. Um, with your ADC inputs, I'd recommend that um, if noise is an issue, you have some kind of filtering on them, just put some kind of RC filter on there. You know, just think about what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of signal content do I want to capture and then design your filter so that you're filtering out, you know, above that. You're filtering out all the little high frequency jittery stuff. Um, and that's, that's kind of it. It's not too complicated. If you don't need to break every signal out from your board, I don't recommend that you do it. If you know exactly what signals you need, just break out the ones that you need and it'll be very clean. But I chose to do a breakout board because I really wanted to kind of show, you know, how to break out all the signals if you really need to. Okay, so now we are to the power section. And uh, this project is only two sheets. I basically the microcontroller page and the power page. So for your input power, I decided to go with a barrel jack. I The reason I did that is I have like a 12 volt uh, switch mode, just a little wall board. So I decided to just kind of use 12 volts as my input. Um, I recommend that you have some kind of reverse protection on your board. For a 12 volt input with a barrel jack, like the barrel jack itself is designed so that you can't reverse it. You probably don't need reverse protection, but honestly, Never underestimate how stupid people can be in the lab. Put reverse protection on your board. And uh, this is, there's, you know, there's a couple different ways you can do reverse protection. You can just use a shock key diode. If you're looking for the easiest reverse protection, just use a shock key diode. Um, I put this on here because this is kind of the, the new way that the cool kids do it. And that is with a PMOS transistor. Um, so, Sometimes you will see this circuit without this Zener diode here. Um, put the Zener diode there. And the reason is that the gate to source voltage of this thing is usually not rated very high. So I believe the gate to source voltage of this, the AO3401A. So, okay, so this thing is rated for 30 volts drain to source, but then the maximum gate to source voltage is right at 12 volts. It is absolute maximum 12 volts. According to the manufacturer, if you put 12.01 volts on this thing, it might blow up. So because of that, we wanna limit this gate to source voltage here. Um, and so that's why we put this Zener diode here and that limits it to 8.2 volts. So I just recommend you do that. If you wanna understand a little bit better how this works, I recommend you look it up, um, but it's very good because the RDS on of these PMOS transistors is usually very low. You have a very low voltage drop across them. Um, and it's just overall a superior way to do your, your reverse protection. So after that, uh, the way this power on this board works is you have 12 volts into a five volt buck regulator. And then that five volts goes into a 3.3 volt linear regulator. So kind of the idea here is that we use a buck regulator to step down to a voltage that's close to our LDO. And then we use the LDO to get down to 3.3 volts. Um, and this is kind of a, you know, kind of nice. The LDO will clean up the dirtier power from your buck regulator. Um, they usually have some supply rejection so they can actually reject noise in the supply. Uh, and it's usually pretty good 
Uh, it's kind of, it can be kind of hit and miss. You can look in the data sheet. But that's why I set it up in this particular configuration. And then for a general purpose board like this, it gives you access to five volts and 3.3 volts on the board, which is really nice because there are still a lot of devices that use five volts. So having access to that is pretty good. So here we've got the buck regulator that I ended up choosing. You'll notice that the schematic uh, is very similar to the, the one that we looked at on JLC PCB, the 500 kilohertz one. And it's because it's, it's just a, it's a simple buck regulator. We've got a uh, bootstrap capacitor here. We've got our catch diode. We have our inductor. We have our feedback setting. And then we've got some output filtering. Um, and I pretty much designed this thing just using the data sheet and using the recommendations from the data sheet. I'm not gonna completely go through that design process. Um, I'm gonna focus heavily on the layout of the buck regulator, but I'm not gonna focus too heavily on the actual design because you can really just follow the data sheet. Just make sure that it has a discontinuous mode of operation. Um, and also make sure that your inductor is sufficiently rated for the amount of current that you need. Um, yeah, definitely. So in this case, this buck regulator is designed for two amps. Um, let me see the inductor that I actually chose from JLC PCB. So yeah, I chose a 3.3 amp inductor for a, uh, for a two amp regulator. And that's because that 3.3 amps is when the inductor saturates and you don't want your inductor to become saturated. Uh, so generally I recommend try to get an inductor that has a current that is rated for like 1.5 times higher than your application. If you really wanna get into the nitty gritty, you can go into the data sheet for the inductor and you can you know, actually look at the saturation curve. But really the basic idea is that the more current you put through this inductor, the lower its effective inductance is. So you wanna get one that is going to be very sufficient. And so that's why that uh, the higher current rating you need on the inductor, the bigger it's gonna be. Um, and also the higher inductance you need, the bigger it's going to be. So if you go, oh, I need a uh, hundred and, you know, I need a 110 micro Henry inductor and mm, it needs to be rated for four amps. Like it's going to be a massive inductor. <laughs> so yeah, discontinuous mode of operation will save your bacon a lot. Now, the additional thing that I do have here um, is this capacitor here. So uh, this is a feed forward cap. So while this regulator is internally compensated, um, doing a little bit of Googling online and looking at WebEnch, which is a Texas Instruments tool, um, a lot of people and WebEnch were putting this 330 picofarad cap here. And it's basically just there for loop stability reasons. So it wasn't explicitly mentioned in the data sheet, but I decided to put it there because I saw it in enough places. So that's why that 330 picofarad cap is there. Um, one extra thing that's on this regulator too is you see that we have this uh, resistor here to select the switching frequency and I chose 1.5 megahertz. Um, I just kind of chose that arbitrarily. And then we have our output filtering and that's, that's kind of our, our buck regulator. We have an enable pin here that is tied high. Um, again, I probably should have done something different with that enable pin maybe. Um, it's, you know, I just tied it high here because I want it on all the time, but also when I apply the USB power, power is able to flow back through here and turn on the 12 volt LED. So I don't know. I, yeah, that's one of the things I don't like about this board. But anyway, yeah, that's the, that is the buck regulator. Um, the 3.3 volt LDO is a much simpler schematic. It is a simpler device. Basically, I just looked at, you know, what input capacitance does it recommend? Uh, and then looked at what output capacitance it recommended for stability. And then if you remember, I added capacitor, I added resistors here for added ESR for stability. And, uh, you know, that it seems to work fine. It seems to be stable. I haven't really tested it through transient conditions, but I'm pretty confident that it would be stable. Um, 
if you have an adjustable 3.3 volt, you know, LDL, then you'd need to do something like this where you've got a voltage that's being divided down to its feedback pin. And really the way this feedback pin works is the feedback pin is trying to keep itself at a set voltage. So what you do is you design this resistor divider so that if this is at its set voltage, then up here is at you know, your desired output voltage. But in the case of this one, it's fixed, which reduces the amount of parts, which I'm a big fan of. And finally, I've got some power LEDs. And uh, the way that I did the calculations for these was I looked up the specific LED that I chose and I looked at what its forward voltage drop was at five milliamps. And I went, okay, well, if I have that much voltage drop across the LED, then I've got, you know, in this case, 3.3 volts minus that voltage drop across the resistor. So then what value of resistance do I need to get five milliamps? And then I just did that for all of them. Um, and if you go and you go through these calculations again, you'll find that these aren't exact and that's okay. You don't need the current through your LEDs to be exact. Um, you know, you just want a general ballpark range. So they, you know, probably kind of look like they're all the same brightness, but, uh, there's, there's some variation here. And I think I normally erred on the side of increasing the resistance rather than decreasing it. So I think these are all just slightly under five milliamps. But yeah, that's, that's kind of the whole schematic of this project. Basically, we've got power, reverse protection. We regulate the power down to two different voltages, one using a buck regulator, one using an LDO. And then over on the microcontroller sheet, we you know, do the power filtering for the microcontroller. We set up its configuration pins and however way the microcontroller says that it needs to. We externally clock the microcontroller. Don't use the internal clock on the microcontroller. Use an external clock source. Please, I beg you, the internal clock sources are terrible. Um, and then you know, we connect our programmer and then we break out the different functionality that we need. In this case, we broke out USB. We broke out every pin. Um, and, you know, we have a test LED. And that's, that's kind of all you're going to need to do for most boards. If you've got other devices on your board, you'll throw them on your schematic and you connect them to your microcontroller. However you need to connect them, whether it's I squared C or SPI or anything like that. Um, and then it just comes down to implementing it in code. But before we do that, we've actually got to do the layout and the routing, which is going to be in the next video. Howdy, and welcome back to another exciting addition to our PCB tutorial series. Today we're going to be doing the layout of the board. So we're going to be defining a board shape. We're going to be putting the parts on it and figuring out where everything needs to be. And then the next video, we'll actually be doing the routing. So we'll be connecting everything up. So starting back in the schematic here, um, I've gone ahead and I've kind of unannotated everything. This is after you've done kind of your first schematic, this is the state everything will be. You'll have parts placed, but they won't be annotated. So you'll just have like a bunch of question marks um, and we'll actually want to get those over to the PCB. So the first thing that we'll actually want to do is we'll want to annotate everything. So you can do that by going up to tools and then you can click annotate schematics. So the scope, um, I'm gonna do the entire schematic. I wanna annotate everything. The order, uh, I usually just go short symbols by X position. I don't really care. Uh, I'm gonna hit reset existing annotations. I'm pretty sure I cleared them all, but. Um, and the numbering, use first free number after zero. So that's just gonna start at R1, R2, R3, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then, yeah, we'll hit annotate and it'll say annotation complete. You shouldn't get any errors, hopefully. And then we'll hit close. And now we can see that our schematic is all annotated and the, uh, the designators are going to be unique per schematic. So you'll see that we only have, you know, we have C1 over here, but we don't have a C1 on uh, this schematic here. Sometimes on boards, you'll see like C1 underscore and then like the sheet number. I don't recommend you do that, especially if you're gonna do silk screen, the names just get really large and it's, it's a pain in the butt. So now that we have the annotation complete, 
The next thing that we need to do is actually assign footprints to all of the parts. Um, so in order to do that, and stepping back for a second, the footprint is what the actual copper is going to look like on the PCB itself. So uh, that's kind of necessary before you do your layout. So if you go to tools here and we go to assign footprints. All right, so once the footprint wizard finally opens up, you're gonna see that you have your components and then uh, to the right, it'll just be blank. And if there's nothing to the right of it, it means that you haven't assigned it a footprint yet. And so what you'll need to do is for every component in your schematic, you need to assign it a footprint. So for capacitors and stuff like that, you're pretty much gonna have all of the footprints that you need already in here. So for instance, for my 10 microfarad capacitor, uh, I might want you know, 0805, so I just double click on that. For my 0.1 microfarad, I just want an 0402. So I can just go down the line, click 0402. Uh, maybe here I want an 0603. And so for that stuff, it's pretty quick to assign it. For the LED, uh, we can find the, let's see, where is it at? There it is, LED SMD. Go here, and I know my LEDs are 0805, so I'm going to select that. Um, and then for this, it, it just says 8.2 volt, but I know that that is my, um, that's this Zener diode here. So then what I would need to do is I actually need to go to JLCPCB's website and figure out what is the footprint of that part. And if it doesn't exist in KiCad, then you're going to need to create it. There are some really good tutorials on importing footprints. Um, there's a lot of different websites where you can just download footprints that are already made. So uh, Snap EDA is one where you can get a lot of good footprints. And you'll just need to import it into KiCad. Um, and yeah, hopefully you don't need to do that for too many parts. But for most things, you should be able to just use a footprint that's already in KiCad. So once you have assigned all your footprints, it should look something like this. Uh, you want every single spot on here populated. Even for things like the uh, the mounting holes, which, where the heck, yeah, here. Have those there. Um, in the actual GitHub project, I have made a JLC PCB tooling hole, so you can also access that. You'll want to double check that the sizing hasn't changed. They do change their sizes, but that footprint is in there for the actual tooling holes. And uh, yeah, we'll hit OK on that. So our schematics are annotated and they have footprints assigned. So now what we need to do is go to Tools and then Update PCB from Schematic. You probably won't get this message. Your PCB file will probably exist already. I just deleted mine to start from scratch. We'll hit yes. And then it's gonna have all this stuff. We'll hit update PCB, hit close. And then it's gonna throw all of this stuff on your board. All of these uh, parts just kind of however it sees fit. And so Looking at this, it might be a little bit daunting because you're like, okay, where, where do I even begin? And uh, there's not even that many parts on this board. And when you do have a really big board, it can be really intimidating when it imports all this stuff. So the first thing that I recommend you do is that you group your parts by functionality. So if we go over to the schematic, you know, we click on the microcontroller, we can go, well, you know, we have the microcontroller, uh, We've got our different, our different capacitors on the microcontroller. And that's right, I can't. I believe there is a way to select multiple parts on the schematic and JLC PCB at once uh, and have them highlight on the PCB. I think there's a way to do it, but this is also, I know this is how I did it when I made this board. Um, if you have two monitors, this is a lot faster, but I'm trying to keep this on one monitor for recording purposes. But anyway, you wanna group everything by part like this. And then you'll kind of wanna do the layout for each individual section. So for instance, you know, we would go, okay, well, this is a 0.1 microfarad cap, 
Therefore, you know, we'll line this up like that. And then, you know, that's our one microfarad for our analog pin that'll go up there. But we'll line our cap up like this. And this is, this is how you want to do your decoupling caps. Um, ideally, you really want to have them, you know, basically parallel to the pin. So you can just run a trace here, a trace here, and then slap vias down right here and, uh, you know, down to your inner layers and then be done with it. Um, and you'll want to you'll do this grouping for all of your different sections. So your microcontroller section, um, this USB connector, you know, even with just this little part going over to the power, you'll want to do it for your linear regulator, you'll want to do it for your buck regulator, your reverse protection, and all of that stuff. And you'll just want to get them all grouped together and, uh, you know, in a layout that makes sense. So I'm actually going to go back to the complete board. I'm going to hide some layers and I'm going to show kind of what my layout looks like when it's finished and we'll go over some of the different layout decisions that I actually made. And we'll also go over uh, defining the board shape too. Also, make sure when you do your component placement that if you're going to have silk screen that you, uh, you actually place it in somewhere where it makes sense. Um, silk screen can make the layout kind of difficult. So sometimes you'll have to do stuff like this where you put the designators, you know, where they're not right next to the part, but it's somewhere that it's still obvious. It's like, okay, C7, well, that's got to be that. C6, that's got to be that. And uh, yeah, I mean, on real, on real like production PCBs, you'll pretty much never see silk screen for passives like this. But on a little hobbyist board, I do recommend including the silk screen. Um, and just make sure that it is a size that JLC PCB can do. Um, one millimeter by one millimeter is fine for them. And then this thickness is also fine, at least for when I made this board. But yeah, just make sure that that is, that is all good. So something I recommend that you do is that you set up the stack up of your board before you start doing your layout. Um, you don't really need to do it until you start routing, but we'll, we'll do it for the layout too. So if we go to board setup and we go to a physical stack up here, this is where you can actually set up your stack up. So I already have this set up for a four layer JLC PCB board. Um, so I recommend that you do a four layer board. You can do more if you want to, but four layer board's probably gonna be totally fine for what you need. And then this is where you can define the thicknesses of the layers and uh, their dielectric constants. And so you'll want to just grab that from JLC PCB's website. Um, that's gonna be the easiest place to do it. And then you can actually go in here and you can set it up so that if you have controlled impedance traces for like USB or something like that, then you can make sure that it's, it's actually gonna be correct. This is actually the stack up from their website. So I recommend that you use their 7628 prepreg. That's the one I've always used and I, I think it's a, a good prepreg. Um, for the actual thickness of the board, 1.6 millimeters is your standard board thickness. I recommend you, you just use that. And then this will actually tell you what the layers are. So for between this layer and this layer, we've got prepreg. And then between our two inner layers, we have core. And you'll notice that their core dielectric constant is also 4.6. So basically we've just got uh, 4.6 all the way around. And then for their solder mask, they also list the, uh, they also list the impedance of that too, somewhere. Ah, yes, yeah, solder mass dielectric constant, 3.8. So, yeah, um, I'd recommend that, you know, you don't just copy my stack up, you go in and you verify that it's actually correct because that stuff can change. Um, but this should, this should be pretty close to whatever they're doing for the foreseeable future. And you also want to check impedance control too. Um, yeah, I'm not actually sure what difference that makes on KiCad, but just, just go ahead and, uh, oh wait, it says lost tangent and epsilon R will be added to constraints. 
yeah, so go ahead and, and check that. Before you get too far into your layout, you're going to want to set up your design rules, and that's just going to make sure that your manufacturer is actually able to design your board. So you look at your manufacturer's capabilities, set up the design rules, and then if you do something that's outside the spec of their capabilities, JLC or JLCP, KiCad will yell at you and tell you, hey, you can't do that. Now, the way that you access your design rules is you go to File, you go Board Setup, and you will go here and go to Constraints. And yeah, these are, these are your basic design rules. Um, you can define some stuff in here, net classes, predefined sizes for if, uh, you know, you've got like a controlled impedance or something that you want to define in here. Uh, you can see that we've, I've actually got one defined in here. Nope, that's the default. Yeah, but I don't think I have anything uh, really predefined in here. Ah, I do have my via hole size defined. Did define that. But the constraints is really what you want to care about. So for JLC PCB, uh, they're not going to have blind or buried vias or micro vias. Um, these are the settings that I, I used and I was able to get manufactured from JLC PCB. If you go on their website to their manufacturing capabilities and you look here, um, I would recommend that you go through and you check that these are still the same. Um, this, this one can get you this minimum via diameter. So here they have it listed as 0.4 millimeters, but the problem is if you do the 0.4 millimeters, they will actually, they'll charge you quite a bit extra for like a flying probe test or something. Um, so you want to make sure that it is not 0.4 millimeters, you want to do 0.45 millimeters. That's the smallest that you can do and still have them just like charge you for a regular via. Um, all of these clearances and stuff worked fine with them. So if you want, I would recommend just copying the rules that I have here and then going into JLCPCB's website and verifying that it's still correct. I wouldn't expect their manufacturing capabilities to get worse, but like also you never know. So this is the layout of the finished board. Um, I've just gone ahead here and turned off some of the, the different layers and stuff so that it <clears throat> you can just see the layout portion. Um, <clears throat> but you'll see here with the microcontroller, you know, I have my decoupling caps placed very close to the pins um, where I wasn't able to, you know, uh, put it in this ideal setup. I still tried to get it as close as possible to the microcontroller. And then the oscillator here, I also have this set up so that the output of this is just a very short trace to the microcontroller. Um, so you really want to keep that oscillator really close to there or a resonator if you're using one. Either one, you want to keep it close to the microcontroller. Um, and then, you know, I have this uh, a pull up on the the oscillator here, so I've just got it kind of over here. And then the decoupling for the oscillator, um, I decided to keep this a one-sided board. I recommend if you're doing JLC PCB assembly that you keep it one-sided. So I put it right here, the actual uh, cap, and then just ran a via down there. But ideally, I would have put this on the bottom side so that it could be you know, closer to the actual chip itself put it on the bottom, and then use vias to kick it out there. This is the analog filtering. So I've got the 10 nanofarad, the 0.1 microfarad, and then the one microfarad cap set up like this. Um, so I've got from smallest to largest going that way, basically. And then more caps over here. And that's the kind of the basics for the microcontroller layout is you just, you want to put those caps next to yeah, you, know, you want one cap per pin. You don't want to put the capacitors in a giant line, which is what uh, people tend to do when they first make a board. And it's what I did when I made my first board. So yeah, um, what you're going to find is that a lot of your layout isn't actually finished until you start routing. You'll kind of get a general idea with the layout of where things will be, but it's not really until you start routing that you go, oh, I need to shift this a little bit or do something like that. Um, a good example is these I squared C pull-ups. So you'll see here, um, this is how I've got the, the tracks running on these. 
And so I just kind of put these up here initially, and then it wasn't until I started doing the routing that I figured out exactly where I wanted them to go. So yeah, there's pull-ups here for the I2C, and there's also I2C pull-ups down here. And then as far as the, the big kind of bulk decoupling capacitance for the microcontroller, you know, this 10 microfarad, um, I just kind of placed it in the general vicinity of the microcontroller. I didn't really know where I would be putting it. I would put it a little closer if I could. Um, I, you know, honestly, I could have I could have put it up here or something like that. Um, but for the the larger ten microfarad, it's not hugely important that it's super close to the microcontroller. Um, I usually just try to kind of put it in between whatever the regulator for the microcontroller is and the microcontroller, just somewhere in between there. And that has seemed to work fine for me. Um, so let's look at the actual regulators now. Um, so the 3.3 volt regulator, really any LDO, you've got your input capacitance and you've got your output capacitance. And in the case of this particular regulator, uh, we also have our um, we have our added equivalent series resistance, which makes the layout a little bit weirder for this. But the basic idea is you want to try to keep the ground pads of your input and output capacitors close to each other, and you also want to keep them close to the ground pad of the chip. And so that's just going to keep the you know actual return path for the chip as tight as possible. So any of that high frequency stuff that's going to get you know filtered or anything like that um, is going to have as small of a return path as possible, and that's that's the case for buck regulators too, and it's more important for buck regulators. But for linear regulators, I still recommend doing a layout kind of like this. So you'll see this is my five volt input, and then we've got this. This chip has two outputs. It's got this output big pad here, and then it's got this pad here. Um, I just have them connected. Uh, yeah, I have them connected via a zone. We'll talk about zones when we get into routing. But really, this is my, my main output that I'm looking at. And so then I've just got uh, these set up so that I've got a nice clean path for the power to go into. Um, when I first started doing boards, I would think, oh, I want my input here. Then I want my output capacitors way over here it seems nice you've just got like a nice straight line um, that'll work fine with a linear regulator but do it like this it also keeps it more compact because really all we're doing is we just got this little zone where we're taking in five volts we're turning it in into 3.3 volts and we're slapping it down to the uh, to the power plane so it doesn't need to be in like a nice line it can just be in this little blob and Generally, as tight as you can make things is going to be better for, you know, electrical performance. So manufacturing will hate you. Whoever's building your board might hate you. But as long as it's within their tolerances, that's totally fine. So moving on from the 3.3 volt regulator, we've got our buck regulator here. And I'm actually, I'm going to pull this out because uh, I want to... Want to isolate it. There we go. I'm a lot away from all this stuff. So this is how I did the layout of the buck regulator. I am not an expert in, in buck regulator layout design. Uh, I largely copied the recommended layout, but this is also a very standard layout for a simple buck regulator. So we're gonna we're just gonna kind of go over this layout here. Um, we're also going to look at the routing a little bit for the buck regulator because talking about the layout without looking at the routing, um, it's not going to be as useful. So starting with the layout, you can see we've got a very similar thing here to our LDO. We have our input capacitors here and we've got their grounds facing because I know that my output capacitors are going to be up here and their grounds are going to be facing this way. And this keeps, you know, the grounds of everything kind of as close as possible. So these are our input capacitors. Now, the trickiest part about the buck regulator is probably the inductor because it's it can be such a large part. Um, 
So this inductor isn't too bad, but basically the way you want to set it up is so that your switching node is as small as possible. You don't want a big switching node. Um, I wouldn't say as, as small as possible, but you, you want to keep it very tight together with the pins and then you'll, you'll do our, our copper fills basically. Um, and actually, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move this back into here because I want my traces to make sense. Um, let's see. So yeah, you can see here I've got this zone set up where I've got this port here. And this is my switching node. And that's the node that's going from 0 volts to 12 volts, you know, really, really fast. And you want to keep it so that it's low inductance, uh, you know, low capacitance so that it can actually do that switching correctly. So generally, this is how you'll place your inductor. So a switching node here, and then the output of the inductor up here. Uh, this is our, uh, our catch diode. Yeah, I couldn't remember the name of that for a second. This is normally how you will have that placed, is just up here. And that's also connected to the switch node. And then our output capacitors will have up here like this. And again, I'm trying to keep the grounds of these, you know, as close to the grounds of everything as possible so that the actual return path for our, you know, our switching currents is going to be uh, very short. We want it to be a very low inductance path for those switching currents. So uh, let's see here, this is our, uh, our bootstrap capacitor. So going back to the schematic, it's actually, do that here this is our bootstrap capacitor right there. And so this is where the recommended placement for it was, which makes sense. This is the pin that it connects to. And then, yeah, it also connects to the switch node, but uh, this, you know, this trace here can be a little bit, can be a little bit longer. I've got it routed on the bottom layer here, but this is generally where they recommend placing it. And I know this, this can be a lot to take in. Um, you're not going to, probably totally absorb the specifics of a buck regulator layout in this video. But um, the, the bootstrap capacitor is one of the things that, you know, you can have a trace running to it. So that's why it's the pin over is also located over here. It's partly how the buck regulator is designed. And then the other thing is the, uh, the feedback traces. So over here is where we've actually got our feedback stuff set up. So here I've got a feed forward cap and then I've got my resistor divider for my feedback. So the thing that you want to do is you want to keep your feedback trace uh, far away from the inductor. So what that ends up actually looking like is uh, it's a very long trace back here to the output. You want to tie it to the output of the regulator. You don't want to tie it to the inductor. You want to tie it to the output over here. And so it ends up being this very long trace over here, but it keeps it far away from the inductor. And it's, it's okay that it's a, a longer trace. Um, I've also made it a little bit wider than you know my standard trace width. I think I made this 10 mils. I think this is a 20 mil trace here. But yeah, just keeping it far away from the inductor, not making it overly long, but keeping it away from the away from the chip as well. You just want to keep it away from the noisy stuff, basically. Um, and then this is just the uh, the frequency selection capacitor or capacitor resistor. So that's this 15k resistor, and that part, you know, the placement of that isn't going to be a huge deal. But I just put it close to the pin slap to be a down to ground and that's it. So turning, turning that stuff off again, that's the basics of a buck regulator layout. You want to keep, you know, your total return loop as tight as possible. Um, you want to keep your switch node, you know, small, you don't want a big switch node. It's going to be too capacitive. And then, you know, it's not going to be able to switch properly. You also want to use fills, which we'll talk about when we get into the actual uh, routing. And then for the feedback trace, you want to keep it far away from the inductor and the switch node as possible, so much so that you actually will route it way the heck up here. So 
those are those are kind of the most difficult parts of the layout. The rest of the stuff isn't too bad. Um, in general, for laying your parts on the board, what I recommend is that you know you try to keep related things close to each other. So, for instance, um, you know I've got my input power right here. So this is my input power connector. I have it very close to my five volt regulator because I don't use 12 volts anywhere on this board. So I want to keep the actual 12 volt section as small as possible because I, I don't really need it anywhere else. So you know I've got this close to here. Um, I have the connectors close together. You know, if I was going for like just sheer electrical performance, you know, I would put this SWD connector closer to the microcontroller, but also it it doesn't really matter. Um, it's it's SWD. It can be it's it's not like a super fast communication protocol or anything. It can be over here. And so the actual position of these connectors um, was just decided based on the routing. So for instance, if you look here, we've got USB here, and then we've got SWD IO there. So that's why I have the USB connector above the SWD IO. So yeah, you'll, your layout, you should do the general layout such that your routing is gonna be easiest as possible. Because if I switch these, then this would be more of a pain in the butt to route, right? Because I would have these like crisscrossing over each other and then I'd have to use vias. But with the way that I actually have it set up here, um, my USB traces don't have to go through any vias. They just run straight to the connector and same with the SWD traces. So there's there's no vias involved with those at all, which for those, those traces, those, you know, data traces, you really want to try to keep uh, you want to try to keep those free of vias if you can. It's not going to kill your signal or anything if you have to use them, but you know, you you get to decide your layout probably. So choose your layout so that it makes your life easier for routing. This reset switch here is you know, it's not like a high speed signal or anything, so you can just kind of put it anywhere. I put it more towards the connectors. These are our LEDs and stuff. Um, for the sake of just readability, I decided to keep the LEDs close to each other. So we have the test LED, and then we've got uh, you know, 12 volt, 5 volt, 3.3 volt. Um, don't put them too close to each other because you'll have it where an LED will light up and it'll almost look like one of, you know, another LED is lighting up. Um, so don't put them too close to each other. Have a little bit of spacing. This is our reverse protection here. Again, the way that I did this is I grabbed, you know, the, what is it, three components. I grabbed the three components that are involved with this, and I just basically went, you know, grouped them together. I went, well, okay, it makes sense to have the diode across these two pins here. That's the easiest for traces, and then this, uh, this resistor I can just kind of place here, or I could have flipped it up here, doesn't really matter. Um, in this case, I've got it flipped this way because then it would start to interfere with this connector. So it's really, it's not too bad. Layout is not that bad. Um, you just kind of have to think about it carefully. For, you know, these, obviously I want to make sure I position these such that they are set up how I did them in the schematic. Because when we did our schematic, we were very careful about thinking how these signals would have to route to here, right? So because of that, we want to make sure that we actually put these in the correct places. Otherwise, you know, it was all for nothing, basically, right? And that's that's kind of it for the actual the parts layout portion. Um, there are a couple other things, though. Um, we'll want to make some mounting holes. We'll need tooling holes for JLC PCB. That's just so their pick and place machine can like grab onto the board. And we also need to define a board shape. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So the way that you define the board shape is you're actually going to use this edge cuts layer over here. And that's what actually defines the board shape in KiCad. So I've actually gone ahead and I have deleted my, my edge cuts layer. And if we go into the 3D viewer, what we will see is that we've got this kind of just ugly uh, rectangular board and 
what KiCad will do is it will just it'll just kind of make whatever board size it thinks you need uh, for your parts automatically. But I like to have rounded edges. No one likes sharp edges on their board. So what you do is you create your edge cuts layer like that. And then I'm also going to need to fill my, my copper zones again so it's the correct shape. Go here, 3D viewer, and then voila, you've got a nicely a nicely shaped board. And the way that you can define this edge cuts is you will just select the edge cuts layer. I recommend that you don't select this fine of a grid, maybe do like a, a 0.1 inch grid. Um, yeah, 0.1 inch I'm pretty sure is what I did. Yeah, I did a, I did a 0.1 inch there. And then we can go to uh, place, draw a line, and then you can go ahead and you can just draw your, your board outline like that. Which I, I know what you're thinking. You're like, wow, that's super ugly. That's also just a rectangle. So the way that you can draw arcs is you can go to place, draw arc, come over here, go to the left, and then you can draw your arc like that. And we've got an arc there. And come over here, draw another arc, like that. Another arc. Draw another arc. And you just, you want to draw the arc, um, you want to draw it clockwise is the way you want to do it. If you draw it counterclockwise, the way it does it is it, uh, it does this. So you want to do it clockwise is probably the way you want to do it. Um, so yeah, you just click, you make it as large as you want. This is your starting point. You click and then you draw clockwise like that. And then from here you can go in and then I just drag these up there like that. Um, not the prettiest thing in the world, but you know, it, it works. Oh, that was the wrong point. There you go. And then you've, oh, oh, we forgot one. Okay, and then there you go. You've got you've got a pretty shaped board. Um, so that's that's how you do your board outline. I'm actually I'm curious what KiCad does if I, I do that. Does it make a yeah? It makes a second board over here. Look at that. So we've got a a multi part PCB. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete that. There we go. So after you do that, actually, I'm, I'm not going to delete it. I'm going to keep it. So after you do that, what you're going to want to do is uh, you're going to want to place your mounting holes. So I define my mounting holes in the schematic. Um, oh, I did my tooling holes in the schematic. I didn't actually do my, my mounting holes in the schematic. I just did those as vias. Um, so if I actually go here and I go to vias, see, so I've just got giant vias here for mounting holes. Um, so yeah, basically I just went to place, I went to add via, I added a via and then I went in and I defined it to be the size of a 440 hole. So, uh, a hole for a, a 440 screw. I just kind of looked up what that is. Um, can I select you? There we go. Gosh. But yeah, what I recommend is you just, you make a via that's whatever size you need it. Uh, might go for a slightly finer grid here. Like that. And then, you know, you can place your, your four mounting holes. And definitely, definitely, definitely change your grid for what you're doing. Um, you know, if you can, I recommend you know, using that, that 0.1 inch grid for component placement and stuff like that is good. Um, for parts placement, uh, you can step it down quite a bit, go a little bit finer. So, you know, for parts placement, using like a 10 mil grid is, uh, is gonna be pretty fine. 
allows you to get some pretty good, you know, some pretty respectable spacing in there. Just make sure that you don't violate those keep out regions, right? And then the, um, the tooling holes, I actually did these in the schematic. Um, the reason that I did them in the schematic is because JLC PCB wants them to be a non-plated through hole. Let's see, where did I? That's right, it's in the root. JLC PCB wants these to be a non-plated through hole. So I actually went through and I set up this, uh, this footprint for a tooling hole that's to JLC PCB specification. So if you want to copy that, you can go ahead and do that. Um, if not, you can make your own non-plated through hole because that's that's really all it is. Is it's a it's a non-plated through hole. Um, but yeah, again, check JLC PCBs, you know, manufacturing rules and stuff before you make your board because they're changing. When I was watching a KiCad tutorial, the stuff that was in the tutorial was outdated as far as the tolerances and stuff like that. How many tooling holes they wanted, where they needed to be. Uh, it was all outdated, so make sure you check out JLC PCB's website for that. Once you are done with your layout, uh, ignore ignore these vias here. Um, ignore all the little tiny vias. It should you know look something like this um, for your board shape. You're probably going to end up defining it to just be kind of whatever size you need, unless if you're making it for like a specific enclosure. But this is this is kind of what your layout should look like, and. It'll probably take a little bit to get right. You're gonna have to shift some stuff around once you do routing, but you know, just give yourself a good starting point. One thing that I would have done differently is I would have actually lined these up so that the spacing was continuously the uh, 0.1 inch spacing. Because of the way I did this, I have to chop up two separate headers and actually populate these. I can't just use one continuous line of 18 pins. I don't know why I did that. Um, so yeah, for, for your header pins, I recommend that you actually line them up so that the spacing is correct. So you can just slap a giant thing of headers in there and not have to cut up two or three separate pieces. I don't know why I did that. But yeah, as you can see, there's not too much to lay out. It can just be a little bit time consuming to get right and make sure that you know it's, it's setting you up good for routing. So in the next video, we are going to be doing our routing. We'll also be doing some, uh, some silkscreen stuff. And then the video after that, we'll be exporting for manufacturing and actually ordering the board. One thing that I realized I forgot after I shot this section of the video is how to actually include 3D models, which is super important for making your board look cool. So if we go here to view, 3D viewer, you'll see that I have removed the 3D model for my inductor. Uh, it's a size of inductor that KiCad doesn't have by default, so I just removed it there. So in order to add a 3D model, you'll go into the actual PCB. You will double click on the footprint of whatever part you want to add the 3D model for. You'll click this little folder icon. And then you need to actually navigate to the correct path. In this case, it is going to be in the project itself. So I need to go there, packages 3D, and then it is the inductor, which, yes, that is the one right there. So this is a step file. So I just, I got this off of Snap EDA, I think. So you just wanna look up a step file for whatever part you have. I'll hit okay. And you'll notice that it imports totally incorrectly. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to kind of play with the rotation a little bit to get it right. So now I'll rotate it like that. And then I think that, oh, that's wrong. Ah, I need offset. And then are my pads right? Nope, so I need to rotate it like, there we go. And then, oh my goodness, bring it back down. There we go. And now we actually have the, the inductor on there. So you hit okay like that. Save it, hit view, 3D viewer, and we can see that, we go ahead and deselect that so it's not green. You can see that you've got your 3D model on there. So yeah, it is super easy to add 3D models for parts in KiCad. Um, 
a lot of these models weren't on here and there was just a lot of bare copper. So I highly recommend you add them because it just, just makes everything look so much cooler. Welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about routing the PCB. So we've done the actual layout, and now it's time to connect everything together so that it does the electricity stuff that we want it to do. So if you did your layout correctly, routing should actually be pretty easy. This is probably going to be a shorter video. Um, I'm not going to go over every single trace here. I'm just going to kind of go over some, some basic routing stuff where you should use copper pores, um, and kind of how to utilize your stack up. So the first thing that I want to cover is that if you're doing a four layer board, uh, only do signals on the top layer and on the bottom layer. You want to reserve your middle layers for ground and for power and that should be it. And the reason that you want to do that is that it's going to make your life probably a lot easier. Um, I won't guarantee it, but it's probably going to make life easier. So for all of our power stuff, um, we don't really need to route it right off the bat. Um, so here's our 3.3 our volt uh, you know, power here. We've got some filtering for a microcontroller basically. And what I'm saying here is I'm like, okay, well, I'll just, uh, I know that I'll have a 3.3 volt power plane here, which I can, I can look here. Like here's my, here's my power plane layer. I'm like, okay, I know I'm gonna have 3.3 volts over here at some point. I know we haven't drawn these layers yet but I know that I'm gonna be able to get power over here. So instead of worrying about routing the power, I can just focus on, I can just slap a via down and not worry about it. And that's good because otherwise you've got these long power traces going all over your board um, and it's not fun. I hate doing two layer boards. Four layer boards are really where it's at. So what I recommend you do is that you go around to all of your you know, your power pins, your power capacitors, there should be a, you know, a filtering capacitor at each pin. And you're just gonna throw down a via for 3.3 volts, you're gonna throw down a via for ground. Um, and uh, in KiCad, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to actually do routing. We can just go route a single track when I have the correct layer selected. And then you can just, you know, draw your Draw your track like that. You can edit the track width. So you can double click on it and you can add the width. Um, I can, uh, I believe you can go with like, yeah, you can do that. So it's kind of cool in KiCad. You can, it's like everything's in millimeter, but I can also type like 10 mil like that. Um, and it'll change the trace width. The other thing you can do is hit control when you select a trace and it'll select kind of the entirety of that trace. So then when we double click on it, yeah, I can type, oh, that didn't, it actually didn't do what I wanted. See, okay, this is, this is how you do it. You select the track, you can hit U to select the entire, the entirety of the track, hit E to open the properties, and then you can type like 20 mil, and then that'll actually adjust the entire, the entire track. Um, so, yeah. There's also, you can select your track width up here. Um, I have a few predefined sizes in here. Yeah, so I've got a five mil, a 10 mil, a 20 mil, and a 50 mil. So um, if you go to, to board setup here, you can define your track widths. Um, I recommend that you define your via sizes here. So I just defined it for the the smallest JLC PCB via size. And then for differential pairs, um, this is just for the, the USB traces. So we'll go over how to, how to figure out what those widths should be too. Um, but yeah, I recommend that you set up your track widths in here. Now, once you do kind of all these, these power pins and stuff, um, and I recommend you do that just so that you, you have an idea of where those vias are gonna need to be, because it will impact how you do some of your your later traces. Um, so you can see here, I kind of had to, you know, I wanted to keep this close to the pin still, but I also wanted to be able to route this out of here. So like, you know, you kind of have to do a trade-off thing there. So after you do uh, kind of your, your power stuff like that, you slap vias down for 3.3 volts. Um, 
I recommend that you do kind of your, your important high speed traces next. So on this board, that's really like, it's really just the USB. Um, it's the USB and, you know, I wouldn't really call this high speed, but still, you know, we, these are priority traces. We don't really want to run them through the vias if we don't have to. So for the differential traces, you want to make sure that on your, on your schematic, you have them named correctly. So if you have an underscore P and an underscore N, then that's going to allow KiCad to know, oh, this is a differential, a differential trace and I should, uh, you know, I should route them differentially. And then what you'll need to do is go into board setup and you will actually want to set up a differential pair. So you can see I've done this for the USB and KiCad has some calculators for um, controlled impedance traces is what these are called but I recommend that you use JLC PCB's online calculator if you're going with them. And let's, let's take a quick look at that. All right, so we're on here on JLC PCB's website. And what we'll do is for, uh, for USB, it's a 90 ohm impedance. So we'll hit 90. We have a four layer board, 1.6 millimeters. They're on the outer layer. I, again, I don't recommend you use traces on the inner layer for a four layer board. You don't need to. And then for the impedance type, this is a differential impedance. Um, and then we can go over here, the trace space, this is I believe in mils. Yes. Yeah, so this is, this is in mils. So I'll just select, um, a four mil trace space. You can mess around with some different ones. Um, the further that you put the traces apart, you'll need to do a wider trace to get the impedance. Um, I'm just using the four mil trace spacing here. I don't really see a reason not to, but you know, you could go for a, a wider trace spacing if you want. For, for really high speed stuff, your trace width can start to make uh, a pretty big difference. So you can start to see more loss and stuff like that. USB isn't high speed enough that we need to worry about that. So I'm just gonna select four mil. And then you'll see that order selection, JLC 7628, which is the stack up that we're going with. You'll see that it recommends 6.89 mil for the trace width. So we can go in here and we can just go uh, 6.89 mil. And I believe it should do the conversion, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do that. Um, if you wanna be safe, you could do it in millimeters, but I'm pretty sure you can do that. And then for the gap, we know that it was four mil. So you can just go in here and go four mil. And then I'll just do the same via gap, four mil. I'll hit okay. And then when we actually wanna route the differential pair, so I'll just, I'll just go in here and delete a couple of these traces, that. Okay, and then to actually route the differential pair, you'll go to route, uh, route differential, or that's the wrong thing. Row differential pair, you'll click here, um, right click, and then select differential pair dimensions. You'll wanna select your differential pair dimensions, and then it'll actually route with the correct dimensions. And then you'll just, you know, you'll do that down the entire board. So we can go here, select that. Um, that didn't do what we wanted. just delete that entire trace route, differential pair, make sure it's still on the correct one. Yes, it is. And then from there, you know, we can, can route our differential pair however we please. And it makes it so it does both traces at once, which is like pretty cool. Um, oh, it didn't like that. There we go, gosh. Sometimes, sometimes the differential pair routing tool is a little weird. Um, <laughs> it's one reason I recommend that you do these before you do any of your other traces is so that you can, you can just route them, you know, however you want to, and then you don't have to try and work around your other traces. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the default routing I have there, but yeah, you can see it's pretty nice and clean. 
And that's how you use the differential pair routing tool. Um, these, these aren't a differential pair, so don't use differential pair there. Here I'm just using my standard five mil trace and routing that. But yeah, you'll just, you know, I also recommend that um, the next thing that you do after that is that you set up your, you know, maybe your pull-up resistors and that kind of stuff. You set up the placement for those, and then you route your other signals. And again, if you did your layout correctly, then it's, you know, it's going to be pretty easy to just draw these straight from your radical controller down to your pins. And um, yeah, in this case, I'd use a few vias here. Um, I had some traces to get out that, you know, the, it just wasn't going to work really without vias. For instance, here, um, I couldn't get these safely through here with the five mil trace width. And I didn't want to go smaller than five mil. I just don't like doing that usually. So I use some vias here. And for traces like these, you know, these are PWM traces. It's most likely what they'll be used for. That's totally fine. Um, it's really your communication stuff that you want to try to keep from going through a ton of vias. But yeah, and then, you know, your oscillator and stuff like that, you want to make sure the traces are really short there. Now, for the power stuff, um, this is where you'll notice I don't really have, I don't really have many traces on the, on the power stuff. And the reason that I don't really have any traces is because I am doing everything pretty much with uh, zones, copper pores. Let's see here, if I turn on zones, I'm going to turn off the back layer. You can see that I have defined these zones to basically connect these different uh, these different parts together, and that's just to you know have as wide of a track width as possible, basically, um, and uh, just to kind of pour over everything. I recommend that you pour over these vias too. I don't know why I didn't do this. Um, it was well. Yeah, I just, I don't know why I didn't do this, but I recommend you pour over the vias too. So, yeah, to actually, uh, to actually place a copper zone, let me go and I'll just, I'll just delete that. If we go place and we go add filled zone, then you can go here and you can actually draw your zone. You have to select what layer it's on, what net it's for. In this case, it's 3.3 volts. Now you can go here and then you can kind of, you know, draw it however you like. Let's see, I'll go over one more there. And then again, I would come down here and I would fill, I would fill around these, uh, fill around those vias like that. And then, oh wow, that's, that's ugly. Okay, that is that is not very pretty. Um, definitely should have added added more vertices there. Wow, that was that was ugly. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of drawing copper zones, but uh, yeah, wow, that's that's really terrible. But okay, ideally, you know, cover cover the pad, the pad in its entirety. I drew this one really quick and dirty. Um, but after you do that, then you will just go to edit, fill all zones, and then it will fill the zones. One thing that I, I recommend that you do is that you do a direct connect on the zone. So if I double click here, um, we don't want to do thermal reliefs. We want to do solid there. And then also on the zone priority level, zero gets the lowest priority. So the way this works is if you have two overlapping zones, uh, the zone with the highest priority will get poured. So what I recommend you do is for zones where you know you won't have any, you shouldn't have any overlap with them, set them to zero. Your ground pours should be like your lowest priority. Um, and yeah, it'll, it might take a little bit of working to get it correctly, but 
Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll select solid there. Um, and then when we re-pour this, we can see that it's, it's actually poured solid over the pads. And uh, obviously define this better than I have. And if you do this, you don't need these, you know, these traces here. Like you don't need that there anymore. Um, but yeah, zones aren't my favorite to draw. They take a little bit to draw, especially to make them look nice. Um, and this is the zone that I drew for the actual board. And it's not even that nice of a looking zone, but it still works. So yeah, and then for the, uh, for the buck regulator, you're also gonna wanna use zones. So you can see for the switch net, um, I've got a big copper zone defined here. Um, and then for you know our input and our output power, I've also got big zones defined there. So yeah, just really using zones for all of your power stuff is what I recommend. Um, and then other than that, you shouldn't really need to use uh, super nicely drawn zones like this everywhere. I'm going to just hide the zones again. Um, for here with the, the input power, I got lazy and I just did a giant fat trace. I could have done a, a zone here too, but I just decided to do a big trace there. But yeah, as far as routing goes, if you do your layout correctly, the routing ends up being pretty easy. Just do your, your high priority traces first. Um, and then the rest of the stuff should kind of, you know, work out naturally. Use vias if you end up needing to use them. Um, and uh, yeah. So after you've done that, you'll actually need to define your power planes. So I'm gonna hide this stuff. Go to inner copper two. And so the way that you'll draw these is the same way that we drew that, that first power plane. And really the goal here is I will draw these so that I just cover whatever vias I need with the power plane, and then I cover the rest in ground. So the way that I'll do that is, um, so here we've got our five volt power plane. If you hit, if you click on the via and then you, uh, you hit control and you click on it, it'll highlight where the different vias are, where you need that, uh, that net basically. And then you can just go and you can highlight over wherever those, those vias are. Um, so the biggest one on this board is the 3.3 volt net, which is right here. Click on one of those vias. Yeah, you can see this is the largest one and it's, it's a very weird shape um, cause I have 3.3 volts down here and I had to get it down there. So it's kind of an odd shape, but yeah. Um, drawing the power planes can take a little bit again is for the, the priority levels. You can see I have, I have this 3.3 volts as a, a zone priority level four, actually. Um, one thing I haven't talked about yet and I, I really should have talked about this earlier is the selection filter. So in this case, I only want to be able to select zones. So I will just only select zones here. And then that makes it so that I can only select zones, which is um, what I want to do when I'm creating zones probably. So yeah, here you can see it's a, a zone priority level five. But yeah, it'll, it'll probably take a little bit to define your zones correctly. Um, and I'm not even saying that this is necessarily the best way to do it, but it is a way that works. It allows you to get power everywhere that you need to. And then on our first inner layer, this is just completely drawn solid with ground. And so you can see all I did is I defined a copper zone on the entirety of the board, and then I just filled it with ground. Um, and the way that I actually did that is that that ground copper pour is defined as being all layers. It's defined as zone priority level zero, it's solid and it's ground. And then it just pours basically everywhere where there isn't you know, another signal. Um, this can give you some weird problems where you've got traces close together like this, where you'll get these large kind of ground antennas. You want to avoid those. So what I actually did is I defined a keep out on the top layer here. 
which, let's see, a rule area? Yeah, it's a rule area. So I placed a keep out and I put keep out copper for there, uh, copper pour there. And so if you go place, add rule area, then you can tell it to not pour copper here. Let me just, let me just take that out really quick. Um, override locks. And then let me pour there. You can see that you get these really long skinny traces here um, that I can't, I can't put vias in to like stitch it together with the other ground. So instead I just, I define a keep out there. Um, and that brings me to kind of the final thing that you'll do with your layout. And that is um, placing stitching vias. So you'll see I've got, uh, I've got ground vias just kind of placed around here randomly. And that's to keep all of the different ground layers stitched together so that, you know, they're all tightly woven and that, um, you know, return currents can take a very short path to whatever layer they need to go to. They don't have to try and go all the way across the board or something like that. So I recommend just kind of put some, you know, vias around randomly. Obviously make sure that they don't, uh, they don't collide with your traces. That's important. But you can see that these vias are, you know, they're just kind of all over the board. And you don't need to make them too dense, but just kind of, kind of put them everywhere and they'll keep your grounds all tightly knit together. And uh, yeah, as far as, as far as layout goes, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, that was a pretty quick, fast overview. But uh, in the next video, we're going to um, actually going to be setting up the board for manufacturing. So we'll be talking about silkscreen a little bit uh, and exporting for JLC PCB and ordering the board. Welcome back. So today we are going to be setting up the board for manufacturing and uh, ordering it from JLC PCB. Just as kind of a forewarning, I'm not going to go over the exact steps for exporting the files from KiCad. And the reason is because the way that JLC PCB wants you to do it tends to change. So instead I'm going to link JLC PCB's steps on how they recommend to do it, which they should be keeping up to date. Um, but we will be going over the ordering process, which hopefully shouldn't change too much. But before we do that, we're going to go over adding some additional silk screen stuff to the board. So the first thing that you might notice about this board is that I've got this, uh, this little Benny the Beaver here, this retro Benny. I've got that on the board. And fortunately, adding stuff like that in KiCad is really easy. So if you go back to the, the kind of main screen here, and you go to image converter and then go to load bitmap. We can load an image. I've got, um, I just downloaded another beaver here basically. So you can see this is enormous. So what you wanna do is you wanna scale it to whatever size you want. I'm gonna go one inch by one inch and then hit, uh, make sure footprint is selected, hit export to clipboard. You just go back into your PCB and then you can paste it in like that. Um, and then you know, I can I can place it you know here if I want to, and then I could change this to the uh, the bottom layer or side back. There we go. Cool. Now it's on the back of the board. So if I actually go here, go to 3D Viewer, um, and flip the board over. Look at that. We've got we've got another another Beaver logo there. Um, you'll probably want to delete that this like little text thingy, which we can just unselect to show that there. But yeah, that's how you can put kind of cool graphics on your boards, which I recommend doing. Um, I also recommend that you add some text to your board. So if you go to place, add text, then you can type some stuff in there, select which silk screen layer you want it on, and then you can place it. In this case, you know, I just, I put my name, I put what the board is for and just like a, a name for the board. Uh, one thing I highly recommend doing is that you give descriptive names for your connectors. It's obvious this is a USB connector, but like, you know, just, just put it there. SWD, you know, uh, put, a, put an input voltage range on your board. You don't want people trying to shove too much voltage into your board. That's not a good thing. Um, 
And then obviously labeling your headers. One thing that I should have done on this board that I didn't was actually put what pin numbers these correspond to on here so that when you're writing firmware, um, you don't have to go to the schematic and then go to the data sheet to look for the pin number. I just put what general functionality that pin is probably gonna have. But yeah, unfortunately on this board, when you want to write software, you have to go to the data sheet and look at that. Um, so yeah, I would add pin numbers here. It just, it starts to become a lot of silk screen. So I decided to put functionalities here, but really I should have put like port A8, you know, port B11, and that would probably be more useful for a general breakout board like this, in my opinion. But yeah, what's done is done. So the one last thing that I've got here is this text on the bottom here. And it says JLC, 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 JLC. It says JLC four times. What that is, is that tells JLC PCB where to put the part number for this board. If you don't tell them where to put the part number and this is their like internal part number or order number rather, they're just gonna kind of throw it somewhere random on your board. Who knows, it might be you know, right next to Benny or something like that. And you don't want that. So you wanna tell them where to put the order number. And actually, if you, if you look at the board here, um, so this is the, the finished board, right? It's not gonna focus, is it? Okay, well, anyway, if we go to the back here, uh, we can see that the order number right there is where I told them to put it. Oh my gosh, yeah, so it's right there. Um, you can also see the tooling holes next to the main mounting holes right there. Well, this camera does not like to focus and I have no idea how to focus it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that just, you know, tells them where to, where to put that so that they put it in a nice spot. And yeah, you can see that with the, the silk screen dimensions I have, everything actually came out pretty well, you know, that you can actually see there. Um, but yeah, all the text is very readable. Um, I don't think anyone would have any problems being able to tell what it says. So overall, it's pretty good. Finally, once you have your design completely done, um, what you're going to want to do is you're going to actually want going to want to run a design rules check. And the way that we do that is we go to tools and then I thought it was in tools Insp ah, and in, in, inspect design rules checker. And then we will hit run DRC and you'll actually see, I've got some warnings here. And what these are is I've got some dead copper on this board. Um, just see if I go here and I click here. There's just, there's some like, there's some copper track in here. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, you could delete it. Um, no, we'll go ahead and delete that. Same thing here. It's just some dead, some dead copper here. So it's complaining that it's, you know, it's an unconnected end basically, but it's, it's inside the pad. Um, so like, yeah, it's, it's not really anything to worry about. The thing that you're really looking out for is uh, unconnected items, you know, unrouted nets, stuff like that. Um, those are the things that you really want to look out for. So if I go here and I just outright disconnect that, and then I go to uh, go to run my design rule check again, and delete all markers, run DRC. And you'll see that this is actually an error. It says that I have a missing connection. You don't want those. Um, you wanna make sure you don't have any errors in your design. Warnings like this, go through them and make sure that it's nothing that you need to worry about. But the errors, you definitely don't wanna have those. So yeah, that's kind of the final step is running the design rule check, making sure that you haven't violated your design rules. Um, if you have components that are too close together, there, you definitely want to make sure that, um, you know, they're not too close together, that you don't have traces too close together. Otherwise, your board won't be able to be manufactured. And the design rules check will tell you all that. So once you've set up all of your silk screen and stuff how you want it, um, the next thing that you are going to want to do is you are going to want to actually export your uh, your files for manufacturing. And that's gonna be from up here. 
fabrication outputs and you'll export Gerber and drill files if you're just doing your, you know, the PCB manufacturing itself. And then if you are doing the assembly, you're gonna also need to export a bomb and the component placement. And what I have gone ahead and done, <laughs> Benny, is I'm going to include these in the description and that says how to generate Gerber and drill files for KiCad and how to generate bomb and centroid files, which is the, the placement file. Um, and this, this walks through step-by-step step how to do it. And then once you've generated those, we're actually gonna, we're gonna order the PCB. But the reason that I'm not doing this step-by-step step is that it changes quite a bit. The tutorial that I was following when doing my board for exporting it, I pretty much couldn't use the tutorial. I just had to go to JLC PCB's website. So I don't feel like going over something that's probably gonna change. So please go to their website and follow the steps. All right, so on JLC PCB's website, what we're gonna need to do is add our Gerber file. And so that's just gonna be um, all of your different Gerber layers here and the oh. NC drill files just put into a single zip folder. And so we'll just hit add Gerber file and we'll add the zip like that. And then we'll select how many layers it is. Uh, we don't need to put dimensions in here. It's gonna be able to get all of that from the, the Gerber file. Um, so yeah, you can see it grabbed our dimensions here. We can see the board shape. We can see that the, the board outline is done correctly. We can see all of our silk screen here. Um, so for PCB quantity, five is the minimum that you can do. You're gonna to wanna to do FR4 for base material. Um, that's what I did in this video. I just followed for standard FR4 board. So, you know, that's what our impedances are set up for. We don't have any different designs. We're just doing a single PCB. So you could define a panel that you could do and then they would send you multiple panels of PCBs so that they're not like already cut out of the panels. But then you have to you have to set up like mouse bytes on your board and stuff like that. Um, and we really don't need that. We just need a single PCB. The material type, uh, just standard FR4. Thickness, 1.6 millimeters. The color, um, this is the color of the solder mask. So you can see that we can select a black board here. I did green because I wanted to get this board very quickly. One benefit to green solder mask is also that it, uh, the traces are very easy to see on the board. And that's why green gets used so much is because the traces are easy to see. So if you do need to make a modification, uh, if you need to cut a trace or something, it's easy to see them. It's not as easy with a black PCB. Um, yeah, they have some they have some really cool colors in here. So I mean, if you want to get a, you know, a fun colored PCB, like you know, you get a purple PCB, pretend it's from Osh Park, uh, you can go for that. Copper weight, the outer copper weight is one ounce. Inner copper weight, we did half ounce. That's what their standard stack up is. Impedance control, we're gonna click yes, which then makes us select which. Uh, which stack up we went with. And yep, we went with the 7628. So we'll hit confirm there. Specific layer sequence. Uh, this is actually a, a new option, I think, but you don't believe you should need that. Uh, via covering. Um, oh, wow, they have filled and cap vias now. This is new. Um, so the tented option they'll cover the vias with solder mass. So the actual copper pad that's on the outside, it'll be covered with solder mass so you can't get at it. Um, untented vias, they will be exposed. So I'd actually probably recommend going with untented so that you can solder to your vias if you need to. These boards are tented. So the vias are, they're totally covered. You don't see any copper around them. Um, Filling and capping, this means that you can actually put vias, um, can actually put them in the pads. Uh, this is going to probably be more expensive. I don't know what JLC PCB charges for this, but um, if you wanted to do via and pad, you can do that now, which is really cool. Uh, surface finish, I generally just go with the hassle with lead. This is up to you. You can go with Enig too. 
Um, Enig is probably going to be fine. It is more expensive. Um, I guess it, it depends on how much you care about your health. So <laughs> this, this one's kind of up to you. Um, we don't need gold fingers. That's for like if we were doing a, a PCI card or something like that. Confirm production file. Um, I'll usually do this. This is just, they will send you an email that contains their like post-processed Gerber files, um, which I recommend doing. Cast yield holes, we don't need that. Remove order number. If you hit yes, it is a little bit more expensive. Um, I just hit specify location and that's where the JLC four times comes in. Uh, and then advanced options here, minimum hole size. This is why we didn't select the 0.2 and 0.4 millimeter. Cause you can see it gets a lot more expensive. I mean, look at that. Uh, wow, that, that really ends up making it a, a more expensive board. And then, yeah, and that's cause it adds this four wire Kelvin test. So deselect that. Yeah, we're back at like $10. If we go back to here and we, it requires the flying Kelvin test, it's like $40. Um, some people say you should do the flying Kelvin test, even if you're, uh, you know, not doing the super small holes, um, you know, for, you know, I'm getting five of these. I only need one board. If one of them doesn't work, I'll just use one of the other ones. So, um, I didn't feel the need to spend the money on this paper between PCBs. Uh, this is just, a. You know, if you're doing the um, the manufacturing, if you're having, sorry, if you're having them do the assembly, you really don't need this. They like individually bubble wrap them and they already put something in between them. So you don't really need to do that. Appearance quality of a and select superb quality. Wow. Uh, silk screen technology. And then package box, JLC PCB logo. Uh, there's, some, there's some new stuff in here. Even since I ordered my board, um, a little over a month ago, there's some new options in here. So like, yeah, they're, they're always changing, but that is, that's kind of the, the basics for, if you were just ordering a board from them, that's all the options you would need to set up. Um, oh, why did, why did that get selected? Yeah, I just want standard FR4. Yeah, definitely make sure you go through and you you kind of double and triple check everything before you order your boards. Um, as you can see, the place where JLC PCB gets you is with the shipping. So yeah, you can do, you can do cheaper shipping too, but yeah, the shipping can definitely get expensive if you need your boards quick. So to actually do the assembly portion, we will click here and then we're going to need to go through the different assembly steps. So PCBA type, um, economic is for a one-sided board, which we did. Assembly side, we only have it on the top. We're just, we're doing five assembled boards. Tooling holes, we can hit added by customer because we specified where our tooling holes are. Um, I don't know if that saves you any money. Doesn't look like it, but we specified where our tooling holes are. And confirm parts placement, um, I recommend doing that. They'll send you an email that will basically have a picture of how they're gonna place your parts. And I recommend you do that, especially if you're having them do parts that have polarity, you know, you wanna make sure that those are in the correct direction. So I'll hit confirm there. Okay, so I've signed in and uh, hit confirm. So for add bomb file, we'll go there. And then we'll add our, uh, I believe that's our bomb file there. Let me, so you can see here, got our comment, our designator, uh, the footprint symbol, and then the, uh, the JLC PCB part number. So we'll hit that for adding the bomb file. And then we'll add the CPL file, which is that component placement file. Again, go through the JLC PCB tutorial for that. And you'll notice here that there's this rotation number. Um, that's something that we are probably going to need to change a little bit, uh, which is kind of a pain in the butt, but I'll show you how to do it here. So we'll hit, oh, uh, breakout board. And then for the selected parts, um, this should come through here. And for all of your parts that you have populated, it should select them. 
you can see here, I didn't uh, get a barrel jack from them or a connector from them. I decided that I am going to populate those myself because I didn't like, um, I just didn't really like the options they had. These are the headers. And then these are the, um, the actual barrel jack itself. They didn't have the size of barrel jack I wanted. So instead I ordered them on Amazon. But you can see here it grabs those part numbers. And uh, I do recommend that you look at the part detail here and make sure that it's like actually the correct thing. Yeah, just kind of give it a quick look over. I know that this is already correct because I did this, but really go through each part and make sure that it like, you're like, yes, uh, 0603 2.2K. You're like, yes, that's the regulator I want, yada, 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 all that good stuff. Okay, so after you upload the bomb and CPL and you hit next, it'll take you to this page. Um, and this is going to show you all of your different parts on the board and the polarities. And what you wanna make sure is that these are all the correct polarity. So you'll actually want to go back to your PCB and you'll wanna go, where's pin one of my microcontroller? It's bottom right corner. Is that actually where I want my microcontroller pin to be? Is it bottom right corner? Yeah, it's, it's right there, it's the bottom right corner. Cool, that's, that's where my pin one is. Is this where pin one of uh, this you know, regulator is? Yes, it is. Chances are you're going to have some parts that are, that are wrong and you're going to need to change the component placement file to update them. Um, the way that you'll do that is you'll go to wherever your assembly files is, go into the position file, and you have to change this rotation number to actually get it to rotate in the correct position. So you'll change the rotation number, and then you'll have to hit go back, go back, re-upload the file, hit next, and then hit next again, um, and then it'll actually be correct. So it's kind of annoying that you have to go back, re-upload it, and then go forward again. Um, it's, it's definitely an iterative process, but Definitely check the polarity of every single one of your parts. Um, there's going to be some that are wrong and you definitely don't want that. Like I'm pretty sure when I imported this file, the microcontroller was like rotated 180 degrees the wrong way. Um, and this transistor was like flipped 180 degrees the wrong way. Like there was a bunch of stuff that was incorrect. I think all the diodes, the diodes were fine, but yeah. Once you make sure that all those parts are correct, you can then hit save to cart. And with any luck, you're actually ready to order your board. Um, and wow, that, why is that so cheap? Ah, okay, sorry, yes. Yeah. So it, it comes in, it comes in two parts. So this is, um, this is the actual, just the board itself, and this is the assembly. So yeah, the total price of this is actually about $70. So then we go to secure checkout, and then you, know, you, can, you can go through and you can actually purchase the board. Um, if there is a mistake in your board where they can't manufacture it, you're going to get an email from JLCPCB that is, their support team's a little hard to communicate with, um, basically you'll just want to fix the problem and re-upload the design. Anyway, I'm not going to go onto the next screen because it's got my address on there and I don't want you all knowing where I live, but yeah, that's how you, that's how you order the board. Um, and that's, that's kind of everything. I mean, you've designed it, you've ordered the board, now you just need to get it, add whatever components you need, and then, uh, you know, connect it up to your programmer and then uh, you're, you're kind of on your way. So I hope you enjoyed this series. I know that I am not, I'm not a PCB professional by any means, but hopefully this was able to at least give you kind of a starting point on where to start your board and you feel a, a little bit better about it. And please, by all means, use the, you know, the GitHub repository I have as a starting point to get yourself going.